testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Well, we'll try it. First of all, I want to thank uh, Wendy for inviting me to be here with you tonight. Um, yeah, that was uh, a very kind gesture on Wendy's part. Uh, I wanted to speak here often in the past, but uh, uh, it wasn't to be. But uh, Wendy is beginning a new year and a new project. And I think it's great, and I want to be a part of whatever she does. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank you for being here, and I want you to understand that going out the gate, if you walk away understanding only one thing about me, and that is I don't wish to, um, to offend anyone, but <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson, I think I've got a little too much mic. Thomas Jefferson said, I shiver when I think that God is just. I, I shiver for my country when I reflect on the fact that God is just. That's a very powerful statement. <clears throat> because what he meant and what he was saying is that uh, if we understand the divine presence in the universe, the, that one that men call God, if we understand anything about the divine presence in the universe, we understand that God is just, meaning that he's not a respecter of persons or people or concepts or ideas. God is above all of that. The divine presence in the universe I have the highest of respect for. But I also understand that God can be very cold, very crass. You break the law, what goes around comes around. You may be a wonderful person, you may be very sincere, you may have done wonderful things, you break the law, and what goes around comes around. There's no escaping divine retribution, period, because it's impersonal. It is totally impersonal. If you jump off a building, you're going to get your comeuppance quickly. If you, if you do something against your, fr your friend, your family, your wife, your husband, or whatever, it may take a couple of weeks for it to come back to you. It may take a month or two. But whatever it is you put out there will come back. Bet on it. And that's why Thomas Jefferson said, I fear f more for my country when I realize that God is just. And the reason I bring that up is because there are many good people in this country who call out, <clears throat> who call out upon God and who, and who want to do what is right and are praying for their country. But in point of fact, God is just. And unless and until you are doing what is right before divine universe, before the divine, unless, of course, you... you understand that truth stands on its own and truth does not need to be validated by ignorance. Whatever is true, it's true. And if you back away from it, that's your problem. God doesn't, uh, there's no playing um, sides. So consequently, I feel that what I do, I'm looking for the real truth. I'm looking for the real truth that's out there, like uh, x file says. And I have come to discover that uh, when it is that you think that you have uh, a good understanding of something, you need to go back and do your homework because you probably don't have it yet. And every time I found that I thought I had it all nailed down, Anthony was right. I've been doing what I do almost of my life. Uh, Forty-two years I have been involving myself in the research of the occult and the dark side of the world. Occult simply means hidden, those things which are hidden. And I've been involved in researching and studying and living with the occult world for some 42 years. And something I have learned is that when you think you know it all, you haven't got any of it. And when you think you've got it all figured out, no, there's one higher than the high one who looks on and you don't have it yet. And that's why humility 
is the first thing that we need to have when we're deciding and when we're thinking about godly or spiritual things is humility because as one teacher of mine once said and I've had some very very brilliant people in my life to help me and this one teacher said that if you can tell some tell an audience something about God so that the whole audience can understand it then that will prove conclusively that you don't know anything because any pea-sized, ignorant, ill-informed, unread brain like yours cannot represent the divine presence in the universe. We do not know the hand of God. All we do know is that whatever you do comes back to you. There are certain immutable laws in the universe. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, if you want to look the other way or if you want to play favorites, then somewhere along the line you're going to find out you're messing with divine justice. So the point I want to make here is that too many times we have been led to understand and told things which are not true, but which are uncomfortable to confront. And consequently, we have been led into believing that the uh, judicial system, we have educational system, judicial system. Incidentally, the word system uh, comes from a Latin word. The Latins in Rome, the ancient Romans called their sewer, the system. And this is where we get our word today, the system. Yeah. So we have an educational system, a judicial system, and consequently, uh, that's where we are, is in the sewer. Now, if we understand that government is corrupt, and God knows now even the most ignorant among this nation are finally waking up to the fact that the whole thing is corrupt. If we understand that government is corrupt, banks are corrupt, our law enforcement are corrupt, there's virtually no institution, our educational systems, no institutions in this country are above taking money under the table and looking the other way and it's become a way of life and soon it will be for America a way of death. Now, once you understand that the entire system we're living under is corrupt and filled with lies and deception and now the best thing you could do if you're a politician is just kind of keep things going, just kind of keep paying people off and hoping everything will come out all right tomorrow, and little by little by little, what goes around comes around, and we are facing a terrible time of judgment, I believe, by the divine forces in the universe which men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. One of my teachers once said, you can't make God do anything he doesn't want to, and if he's going to do something, you can't stop him. So consequently, since you can't influence it one way or the other, you should get in tune with the divine force of the universe and go with the flow. And that's what I believe, and that's what I've been trying to do all of my life. Just go with the flow and find out where the facts lead you. Because the more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? You can bet your bottom dollar that the religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, the Knights Templars who set up your international banking cartels in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century are the same people that gave you educational institutions, colleges. Where do we get the word college? College comes from the collegia, the Latin Roman college of cardinals. Uh, when you, when you, I mean, I could go on for hours just giving you examples. I mean, when you graduate, you come out with a square mortar board, a black square mortar board. What's all that about? Black square mortar boards. It has to do with the planet Saturn. Saturn, you know, we're told that in the Old Testament, 
that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, were worshipers of one God. That's never been true, not true now, and never will be true. That's just one more story that's been given to us. That's never been true. The Hebrew people were worshipers of many gods, many different divine beings. They were, uh, they were the most eclectic, the most eclectic theology on the face of the earth uh, next to modern day Christianity is Judaism. Eclectic meaning it has collected from all over the world concepts and ideas and put it together and called it today Judaism. Judaism today is the most eclectic religion on the face of the earth. Virtually nothing of what it teaches is true. <clears throat> Virtually nothing of, what, of, its, um, of its supposedly background is true. And consequently, the world is filled with violence, bloodshed, or disorder. Good people are dying. There are children who are starving. Our world is in trouble. And people are calling out to God for protection. People are calling out to God to help our nation and never realizing for one moment that the divine presence in the universe not listening. Why? Because you have your own concepts of whatever you think is true, whatever you believe to be true, but you have never confronted the real truth. The real truth is that, that the people who are in power, who put this system together, have been in power for thousands of years. This has been going on from day one. I have the highest of respect for the Bible. Anyone who knows me knows I read it and study it all the time. But I'm also well aware that there are encoded messages. The rabbis will tell you that, that in the Old Testament is filled with encoded messages. And I believe that Christianity is probably the most powerful encoded message the world's ever had. It's one of the oldest messages in the world, and I believe that the Christian teachings in the original scriptural understanding is the most important volatile story the world's ever known. And it's sitting right in front of you and most people don't even see it. It is an encoded story. And unfortunately, too many people who are ill-informed, unread, and who have not spent 42 years looking at theology accept what they read in the New Testament and in the Old Testament as actual history, when in point of fact, it is not actual history. There is a message behind the message. And consequently, if you're reading the Bible, and if you're looking at theological subjects from the Bible point of view, uh, in a materialistic way, you're never going to see the obvious story sitting right in front of you. I believe that the story in the New Testament, <clears throat> and I'm concerned about this because I believe the world is now facing another dark age. I think that we are now preparing ourselves to go into a very dark Time that's coming on the earth. And I believe that the, the message that's in the New Testament is a very powerful, uh, symbolic, metaphysical story that's, that is not very well understood today. Let me go back to the original Hebrew religion. Because it forms the basis for Christianity, we need to look at <clears throat> where did any of these things come from. I'm famous for doing that. I couldn't care less who I offend. I want to know the truth. And all you got to do is go to any good library and just start reading. There are hundreds of great reference books out there that tell you where things have come from. First of all, <clears throat> all of the things which are going on in this world today, uh, from 9-11, all of the wars in the Middle East, all of the, uh, the incredible bloodshed that's being uh, spilled all over the earth, can be traced back to, and you might want to remember what I'm saying here, because you, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to make the connection when I first tell you, but I'm going to try and explain it to you. The things which are happening today, the people who are in power in this country, um, the, the, the great generals from around the world who are planning wars and violence and bloodshed, all of this stuff can be traced back to the planet Saturn. Saturn is a very, very pivotal, important,
concept in theology and religion. And most people have never been told any of this and have no knowledge of it at all. But the planet Saturn is very important in world affairs, in theology. In the Islamic belief, the holy city of Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, Mecca has <clears throat> a Masonic circle and within the Masonic circle is a square because you got to do everything on the square remember <clears throat> you have a town square you have New York Square you have uh, a Vatican Square you have a red square you have uh, all kinds of squares why because this is Masonic and it goes all the way back into the ancient world the terms and symbols again the planet Saturn is called the black square It's called the dark sun the black sun this is what the Nazis and the SS and the Gestapo wore black that's why uh, priests wear black that's why judges wear black robes why do you think a judge wears a black robe he wears a black robe because when you used to graduate from university you wear a black robe why black robes? Darth Vader wears a black robe. What the hell does a black robe have to do with anything? The judges wear black robes. You know, Supreme Court judges wear black robes. Black robes represent the priesthood of the planet Saturn, the Saturnalian Brotherhood. All you need to do is study Nazism, and you will begin to see that the powers behind the Nazi party, the Thule Society, the Germanian Order, were all members of something called the Saturnalian Brotherhood, the Brotherhood of Saturn. Saturn was the god of darkness, chaos, and destruction. He teaches you a lesson. He will take your life if you don't listen to him. So consequently, Saturn was very, very important in the ancient world. Thank you. <clears throat> Saturn's name, incidentally, in the old Phoenician ancient Canaanite religion, um, in the Middle East, the old Phoenician Canaanite worship of the planet Saturn was the most important god of all the ancient world was the planet Saturn and his symbol long before the Hebrews were ever in Cana, the symbol in Cana for the planet Saturn was a six-pointed star. Today we call that, today we call that star the star of, of David. There was no star of David. It's the star of Saturn. All of the Jewish reference books, all the Encyclopedia Judica, all of, uh, you go to the synagogue, uh, go up into uh, Mulholland Drive, up to the Jewish University and spend three weeks there and look up Saturn. You'll find out that 98% of all Judaism is a worship of the planet Saturn. Better wake up and understand where this stuff comes from. Because if there is a God in heaven, if there is a divine presence in the universe that demands righteousness and justice then you're going to have to rethink what we believe and where we're going and what the world is all about because for the last 2,000 years we haven't done too well. Logic alone should tell you that when Jews were being marched into concentration camps uh, they were praying out they were praying obviously to their God for protection and for help. There was no help coming. Christians have been praying to God to help this nation, to, to protect their family, and evil grows and multiplies each day. And the more Christians pray, the more evil the, the pervasiveness becomes. And the reason why is because we are not in tune with the universal God force. We're not in tune with the truth. We're in tune with what we've been told is the truth. We understand that thing that we've been told about government, that there, we have to pay your taxes because that's the law. You think, what law? Where is there a law that says that? Well, it's in there somewhere. No. Where is the law? And then you find out, well, it was just a lie. The whole thing was a lie. The whole thing is a sham. Well, the same thing is true in our theological thinking. The reason why I'm bringing this subject up is because I feel it's important now in the year 2000 too, because I think that very soon we're going to experience some pretty dynamic spiritual things are going to begin to happen on the earth because I do not believe 
that the divine presence in the universe that men have called God is going to allow this to go on much longer. But the way history has always shown us is that when God moves, theologically speaking, when God moves, people die. And consequently, I think that we are coming to a point where we're going to be in serious trouble, and that's why I want to help my fellow man to become spiritually prepared for what's coming. And the only way you're going to do that is understand where things come from and begin to appreciate we've been misled again. Uh, <clears throat> I have tons of, of videos, and I mean, you have slides I'd like to show, but there's so many things I want to talk about too. Let me get back to the planet Saturn. Saturn was referred to, as I said, its symbol was the six-pointed star. Today we call it the Star of David. Uh, Saturn was referred to as El, E-L. El was the god Saturn in the old Phoenician Canaanite system. And consequently, anyone that promoted the worship of El is where we get the word elder. You become an elder because you are worshiping El. And when you worship El and become an elder, then uh, you, uh, how did you get to be an elder? You got elected. So therefore we have elections. <clears throat> now that you have been elected to be an elder, now you are one of the elites. Why? Because now you have moved up like in an elevator. You are now moved up in society. Consequently, it's all money. It's all manipulation and exploitation coming out of Phoenicia, Cana. It goes back to the old Sumerian, Babylonian systems of words and terms and symbols and emblems that have been used to manipulate the whole human race. Because our masters don't give a damn about you or your family or, or your destiny with God. All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole damn world. <clears throat> Consequently, if anything's going to happen in this country to turn it around, we're going to need a renaissance, an intellectual, spiritual renaissance. Because you can't do it with arms. Adolf Hitler rose to power the same way George Bush did. It's the simple Mickey Mouse routine that it works every time. I'm ashamed of this country and I'm ashamed of the people who call themselves Americans who drive around with a damn silly ass flag on their car and not even realize that's not an American flag. <laughs> All you gotta do is do your homework. You find out that is a United States flag. And it's not even an original United States flag because an original United States flag has these stripes going vertical, not horizontal. But who the hell knows that? Who cares? I mean, we just put a, put a flag on your car and drive around like a fool. It's, it is a disgrace. Somewhere along the line, we're going to discover we've been had, if we haven't already figured it out. I want to show you how the planet Saturn the Saturnalian Brotherhood, the worship of the planet Saturn. <clears throat> Saturn's color was black. The black, uh, all, each one of the gods and each one of the planets were associated with a different color. Green was associated with Venus, and that's why today in Islamic countries today, you will see all of their flags and halotry in, in Islamic world are in green. And you'll see the crescent with the star. Many people think the crescent is the crescent of the moon, but it is not. According to the actual uh, research documents, <clears throat> the crescent on the Islamic flags is the crescent of the planet Venus. And the star represents Venus. It is a religion that is based on the worship of Venus, but which has incorporated the Saturnalian philosophy in it. So, like all the other religions, it is also a very eclectic religion. <coughs> uh, we hear that God's name is you know, Yahweh. Let me tell you something about Yahweh. I mean, I've spent 42 years looking at this stuff, 
And as far as I'm concerned, I'm amazed at how many people don't even begin to know what these words mean. Yahweh is not the name of God. Yahweh in Hebrew is an expressive term. It's expressing something. It's uh, describing something. It's not, a, it's not a formal name of God. Yahweh in Hebrew simply means, and the best way to explain what the word means, is to take a garden hose and twist it, hold the, 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 the end of it, turn on the water, and you feel the pressure building up. When you release the hose, it's a release of pressure. It's a release of energy. In the Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew, the release of dynamic energy was called Yahweh. And it was always associated with sex. It's the building up of the sexual urge and the releasing of sex in the sex act was referred to in the ancient Phoenician Canaanite system as being one with Yahweh, the explosion of divine creativity. That's why our Jewish physicists have told us the universe came into existence by a big bang. <laughs> Consequently, I become very up on, I become very disorganized in my thinking because there's so many things I want to show you. So many things I've been wanting to tell people for years. <clears throat> I got to boil down 42 years into an hour or so. But suffice it to say that the planet Saturn is very important and you need to remember that and do some research on it and you will find that the Nazis were, the Nazi party was probably the most glorious Saturnalian brotherhood we've ever seen. Nazis were heavy into the Saturnalian system of philosophy, war, destruction. The ancient Phoenician Canaanites said that the women should listen to their god Saturn. They always knew Saturn had rings. So they said the women should listen to their gods, so women were, women were to wear ear rings. Men were to get married before their gods, so they were to wear a wedding ring. Kings were to get uh, crowned before their gods, so consequently they would have a round crown, the corona, the ring. Saturn is the god of this world. From that we get the dark side of the force, Darth Vader. Remember Darth Vader with his Nazi helmet speaking through the Masonic Triangle? Somebody better do their homework. This stuff is fascinating when you get into it. In the ancient Phoenician Canaanite system, when it finally <clears throat> bled into Europe thousands of years ago, it formed what we, what we call the Celtic Druidic system. The Celtic Druidic system uh, had its origins in the old Phoenician Canaanite system. That whole area we call today Israel and Lebanon, that was called Phoenicia Cana. And consequently, that whole system of the Canaanite religion uh, found its way into Eastern Europe and then into Northern Europe <clears throat> and formed the basis theologically for what came to be known as the uh, Celtic Druidic system. The Celtic Druidic system, one of the most important symbols, and some of you have heard me say this before, one of the most important symbols in the old Celtic Druidic system was a magic wand, like Merlin the magician with his magic wand. That's Celtic Druidic. Magic wands were always made out of holly wood, okay? And they're still working their magic on us in Hollywood. The system that we are under is a most manipulating, exploiting system that's ever been put together. But I'll tell you one thing. The Steven Spielbergs and the George Lucases and the Michael Eisners and all the guys that run the entertainment world, all of them, are many things, but stupid is not one of them. These guys are class A, top of the line intellectuals. They know the name of the tomb. They know exactly how to manipulate your thinking. They have something called program music. And you go in and you never, most people never think when they go to a movie or watch a television show. They never think about it. Who writes scripts? Scripts are written by scriptwriters. Scriptwriters scribble scripts. 
And consequently, the script, the scribbling script writers were called scribes. So when Jesus denounces the Pharisees and the scribes, the scribes were the people who scribbled scripts. And consequently, the religious writers of the day, those who wrote all of those glorious religious writings, were all the scribes. They're being paid money by the system to write all of their silly little scribes, all of their silly little stuff that the masters wanted. Why do you think the King James Version is called the authorized version of the Bible? It's the one King James authorized. He didn't authorize you to go doing too much research on your own. You get your head cut off. Consequently, we go back to Yahweh. I mean, have you ever wondered why we call God the Father? You ever thought about that? I mean, women, uh, some of the women's lepers were saying could be a God the Mother, you know. I don't know. But the point being is that why do we call God the Father? It's because of rain. Rain is why we call God the Father. Because in the old ancient Hindu, if you go back into the old Sanskrit writings of the ancient Hindu religion, you will find that the divine presence of God, the, the Most High, was referred to in their language, in the old Sanskrit language of India, God was referred to as rain, R-A-I-N, rain. And consequently, the idea was is that the earth was our mother, mother nature, mother earth. And mother nature gets impregnated with God's, the Father's sacred fluid that comes and falls on the earth and impregnates mother nature because everything grows. And so once a year, there was a celebration of Phoenicia Cana when the spring rains would come. And consequently, the, the Phoenician Canaanites knew that the rains were coming and it was going to bring a whole new life to the earth. So consequently, they had a, they had a celebration of spring and it was called the Marriage Feast of Cana. The Marriage Feast of Cana. And this is in the Bible. As I said, that there are many things in the scriptures that are hidden right in front of you. And if you don't know what they mean, you don't know where they came from, You'd be surprised when you begin to look at where these stories come from. The whole idea of the marriage feast of Cana was Mother Earth, Mother Nature, asked God's Son, our risen Savior, and of course the Son is your risen Savior. As a matter of fact, if it don't come up, we're dead. So consequently, the Son was our risen Savior, and, and so Mother Earth asked God's Son to draw water. The water is drawn by the Son so it can grow it can fall on the grapes and the grapes can be made into wine so it changes water into wine and this is goes back to the old ancient phoenician canaanite and even the jewish rabbis will tell you that consequently there are symbols and ideas and concepts in government which are put there purposely to mislead uh mislead you there are symbols and ideas and 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 all of our systems purposely to mislead you and i'm saying that even the theological basis for what we think we're doing has also been misled. And until such time as we get it right, we're never going to have that divine protection that the universe offers you when you're doing it right. And again, what I do is not to offend anyone, but I want to show you how these things have crept into our modern day society. Our international banking cartels, which control, finance, and organize and direct all of this corruption, wars, and bloodshed, and we're all well aware of that, but most people don't know that international banking cartels go back to the Vatican. The Vatican, as far back as the 5th, 6th, and 7th century, was the power of Europe. The Vatican dominated Europe, and Europe dominated the world. Even the Uniform Commercial Code, the international banking codes of the world, are based on Vatican canon law. I mean, that's why when you walk into a courtroom, why do you have to go to court? Does anybody ever wonder why you go to court? I mean, you play basketball on a court, and you play tennis on a court. The whole idea in a court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. That's right. It's just a game. Back and forth, they're throwing the ball back at each other, and the judge is there wearing a black robe. Blocked because of the planet Saturn. Saturn was the god of banking. 
That's why the, the judge sits on the, on the bench. Look it up. Look up the word bench. You will find the word bench is a Latin word for a bank. So the judge rules for the bank. He don't care who's going to win or lose. Somebody's going to pay. And he's going to get paid. What does he care? Okay? So consequently, the judge rules for the bank. He sits on the bench. The whole idea is you're in court to play ball back on the court. How do you play, how do you play uh, tennis on a court? You play with a racket. Why? Because the whole thing is a racket. They're using terms and symbols and emblems. And they're playing on you. You know, a lot of people think, well, these are just play on words. Don't bet on it. We have something called the California criminal justice system. Criminal justice, not American justice system, not the people's justice system. It is the California criminal justice system. You think that's by chance? Think about it. You think that the government makes mistakes? The only mistake is that you're thinking that they're making mistakes. These guys know what they're doing. When they say criminal justice, they know what they're talking about. The criminals are in charge of the justice. That's why it's a criminal justice system, okay? The mafia runs this town. I personally know that. Los Angeles is run by the mob. If you don't think so, they got their own license tags. The mafia has its own license tag that the police department does not touch. They see a mafia license tag, they do not touch it. I'm not going to get into that. But I can tell you that the mafia and the mob runs this country. And the Catholic Church is behind the mob. Period. My mother had an uncle when I was growing up as a child. I only remember him faintly because I was very little. He worked in the Vatican, Secretary of State's office. He was not clergy, he was civilian. And I grew up in my hometown having two uncles who were federal judges. My great-grandfather was a senator from the state of Florida, a very powerful man, and he died in office because they couldn't get rid of him. Why? Because he was mobbed and everybody knew it. My uncle Joe Valenzino used to come over every now and then with his big cigar and sit, and my father used to tell me, don't you ever, ever ask Uncle Joe what he does for a living. <laughs> ever. You just take whatever little presents and be cool and sit down, and if you open your mouth, I'll knock your teeth out, okay? <laughs> so I understood. There was a system in operation. My mother, my beloved mother, my father, my family, all of my family, including myself, were born and raised Catholic. So I'm not talking about the Catholic people. I'm not talking about the black people. I'm not talking about the Jewish people. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about political organizations. We're talking about institutions that are financed all over the world. Huge, powerful financial empires. That's what I'm talking about, not the people. So I grew up understanding that there was a whole system in operation, and I decided at the ripe old age of 19, 18, when I left home to come to California, I wanted to be on my own and do my own thinking. And I started out immediately collecting and reading books on Nazism, the communist movement, the philosophies, all the different occult sciences. And it only, uh, it, it became apparent to me that the entire world system is corrupt. So what we have today on the world scene, we call them world governments and United Nations with all the different governments uh, represented. In point of fact, what we're seeing is gang wars. We got the Crips and the Bloods and the East Side Gang and the West Guy and, and this group and that group. And today we call them nations. No, they're only gangs. They're all, they're all corrupt, money-grubbing, and uh, so consequently, what goes around comes around. And we're seeing the complete breakdown of law and order around the world, and I believe that there is a divine retribution coming, and this is what I'm trying to do, is make people aware that do not put your faith and trust in man in whom there is no salvation. Do not look to your religious institutions for any spirituality. They don't have any. 
I don't care what it is, they don't have it. The very word church, the word church is an English word from the King's English. It goes back to a word in Scottish, kirk, K-I-R-K, is church in English. Kirk in Scotland goes back to a Roman goddess, Circe. Circe goes back to a Greek goddess in Greece called Circe. Circe gave birth to Roman Circe. Roman Circe gave birth to Scottish Kirk, and Scottish Kirk gave birth to the English word church. So consequently, when you go to church, just remember, it goes back to Mother Circe in Greece. <clears throat> Circe, if you go back to the library and get some books on Greek mythology, it will tell you that her name gives birth to what we call the church today. And Mother Circe was able to hypnotize people and bring them into her home, hypnotize them, and so that they would lose their mind and become animals, and then she would feed off of them, eat them and feed off of them. That's Greek mythology, Mother Circe. <clears throat> so consequently, Mother Church has done just that. She has hypnotized people, brought people into her house, into her house, and um, consequently lives off of them. One of the most important uh, financial institutions in the world is the Roman Catholic Church and all the other churches like the Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists and Christadelphians and Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to catch up with. Consequently, all you need to do is just go see Godfather Three, and it will tell you, what tr that's a true story, Godfather Three, about the killing of the Pope, when the propaganda due, the P2 Lodge of Freemasonry, uh, got, had to get rid of the Pope, because he was a good man. That particular Pope was a good man, and he wanted to try and straighten out the church, and they figured they'd better straighten him out. So he was dead. <clears throat> he died on the, 30th, the 33rd day of his pontificate. He died on the 33rd day. I think that's interesting. <clears throat> and that's in the movie Godfather 3. Um, consequently, I don't know if you know this or not, but the, uh, at the end of the Second World War, to show you another facet of the church's work, um, during the Second World War in 1945, actually 45, early 45, when the German and the Nazis began to see that, the, uh, that they were losing the war, and it became evident that the Nazis were going to lose. The, <clears throat> the powers that be in this world wanted to get the top Nazis out of, out of Germany before the Russians or the other allied uh, forces came through and would kill them. And so consequently, the Vatican, along with uh, the CIA, the American CIA and the Vatican made a deal uh, where the Vatican would provide for all the top Nazis their false passports, uh, false ID, and uh, slip them out of Europe and send them to Central America, South America, Uruguay, and Paraguay, which incidentally those two countries were founded by Jesuits. <coughs> Probably uh, some of the most powerful criminal syndicate in the world is the Jesuits. But um, so we have the Nazis here in America. You know, we went to the moon, supposedly, with good old American ingenuity, like Dr. Werner von Braun and all those other Nazi fascist murderers that came here who are making money off of this people. And we, I, I just amaze when I watch the space shuttle taking off and you see all the Americans standing out there in Florida watching the space shuttle take off and everyone's applauding. I think, what are you applauding for? You ain't going anywhere. The hell are you applauding for? If they're going somewhere, you're not going, that's for sure. You can pay for it, but you ain't going. You ever thought about how much pollution? I mean, poisonous, toxic pollution that pours out of the, out of the back end of a Saturn booster, how much poison is poured out of that into our atmosphere every time they shoot one of those things? <clears throat> Nobody, most people don't think about that. <clears throat> Consequently, I believe that it's a time that the idea, this time has come to look at the real foundations of our system of thinking in this world because if you're going to call out to God, you better get it straight because there are too many times in the scriptures and I again have to reemphasize my appreciation for 
uh, the divine principles in the scriptures. I believe that there is a profound story, especially in the New Testament. I think that the New Testament is a redemption story. But most people have no idea in the world what redemption means. Well, the classic example, how many Christians understand what Christ means? I mean, you can't talk, you know, I hear Christians talking all the time about Antichrist, and they haven't got the faintest idea what Christ means. How many people know what the word Christ means and where it comes from? <clears throat> I mean, how many Jews talk about the Holocaust and haven't got the faintest idea in the world what a Holocaust is? Oh, a Holocaust is a terrible tragedy. Oh, it's a big fire or, so, or something like that. It's terrible something. No, no, no. That's not what a Holocaust is. A Holocaust, according to the actual research documents, means a sacrificial, ritualistic burnt offering. When Abel and Cain and Abel in the Bible offered up a sacrifice to God, the, the word in the Hebrew Bible is they offered up their Holocaust to God. So a Holocaust is a ritualistic, sacrificial, burnt offering. Get it right. Why did the Jewish leaders in this country and around the world use the term Holocaust? Very interesting. I think that they are not telling us the whole story. Consequently, as I said, how many Christians use the word Antichrist and don't even know what the word Christ means? Christ comes from Christos. <clears throat> Christos in Greek means oil. That's why you have Pillsbury cooking oil called Crisco. Crisco is Christo. Christo is Christ. So Jesus Christ is Jesus the oil. I mean, that's what it means. Jesus oil. Okay? <clears throat> you say, well, Jesus, well, why? Well, because Jesus was the anointed. When you always uh, uh, become anointed with oil. The kings in Israel were always anointed with holy oil, so they became anointed. You know what the word anointed means in Hebrew? I don't want to get into that right now. Basically, anointing comes from the word sex. You'd be surprised how much sex is entwined in religion. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's a huge amount of words and terms and symbols. And when we begin to see how these stories have been put together and misrepresented, again, I believe that the Bible has been misrepresented. I think that if you go back into the ancient world and begin to see where the Bible comes from, who wrote it, and you begin to read the en encoded story, it becomes fascinating stuff. And when you understand that, and I do a whole lecture, sometimes it takes four to five hours for me to do it, um, on astrotheology. Astrotheology is the basis for all religion on the face of the earth. It's called astrotheology. Happily, most people don't know that, so nobody's offended. But most uh, people do not realize that astrotheology forms the foundation for virtually all religions on the face of the earth. It has to do with the worship of the heavens. <coughs> And if you go back into the most ancient times, and this is a subject I've always loved, is ancient theologies. And if you go back into the most ancient times that we know of, the most, uh, all nations of the world and all the ancient world agreed that the most uh, uh, evil presence on the face of the earth, the most evil thing in all the ancient world was darkness. When the sun went down, it gets cold, and the boogeyman comes out. And all of the predator animals come out. They're coming out because it's cold and they're looking for something to eat. And humans are not designed to live like that. Humans have thinner skin or are designed by their creator not to live like animals. I mean, we couldn't live in a forest like a deer that is sub-zero and it doesn't seem to bother him. You'd be dead in about an hour. But the point being is that darkness was the most evil thing that man had to face. And consequently, all of the predator animals came out at night, and it got cold. And consequently, 
when the sun would come up in the morning, that was the one thing that saved the human race, is the coming of the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. Of course, the sun lights the world. And the sun doesn't belong to China or Africa or anybody else. It belongs to God. So it was God's sun, our risen Savior. And of course, the sun is your Savior, because if it don't come up, we're dead. But once you understand the concepts and ideas, then you begin to question, why did Judas go out and kiss Jesus? The scripture, you know how, and the scripture talks about Judas went out and kissed Jesus? First of all, the, many Christians think Ju Judas went out and kissed Jesus to identify him. Logic alone would tell you that's not true. You just think about it. I mean, in a little Mickey Mouse, little Mickey Mouse town, uh, and, and, and where Jesus would have been living in a little small, it's not Chicago, it's a little small town and even the Romans back in Rome knew who Jesus was so everybody knows who he is, everybody knows what he's doing and consequently when the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders decided they'd had enough of him and wanted to arrest him you think they're going to have to send out somebody to find him and point him out? No, everybody in town knows who he is well, then why did Ju Judas go out and kiss him? And most people think Judas went out and kissed Jesus to identify. It doesn't say that. It says he went out to kiss Jesus to betray him, not identify. What do you mean, betray? <clears throat> That's interesting. Because even the mafia today, when they're going to kill you, they give you the kiss of death. They've kissed you off. Why? Because in the old ancient world, when a scorpion bites you, the scorpions in the Middle East have two stingers, one on top of the other. And when they bite you, they leave a cut in your skin that looks just like a human lips, looks just like lips. And consequently, the ancient people said that you just got the kiss of death. He just kissed you off, okay? And consequently, that's what Judas was doing, giving him the kiss of death. Why? It has to do with astrotheology. Very interesting stuff. Now, I could talk all night on this stuff because I love it, but I wanted to show you a few because I believe that uh, seeing things uh, are a lot more impressive than just hearing me talk. If you remember Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, first of all, when Indiana Jones is going out to look for the Lost Ark, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Where's the first place he goes to? He goes to Tibet. Now why would you go to Tibet if you're looking for the Hebrew Lost Ark of the Covenant? Well, it's because Tibet has something very, very important connected to that symbol of the Ark of the Covenant. You better go back and look at the Buddhists and the Tibetans to understand the Ark of the Covenant, period. Second, where does he go? Once he goes to Tibet, who does he find up in Tibet looking for the lost ark if it isn't a Nazi? And consequently, where did, where did they go from there? He goes directly to the Holy Land to look for the lost ark of the covenant. No, he goes to Egypt. Why Egypt? It's because Steven Spielberg has many things, but stupid ain't one of them. He goes to Egypt because the whole idea of the, of the lost ark is Egyptian not Hebrew. A thousand years before Hebrews were ever in the area called Egypt, they had, the Egyptians had something called the Ark of the Contract. The Ark of the Contract, which I will show you, the Ark of the Contract was a box with two angels' wings, uh, with wings over it, and it was an Egyptian symbol, and it symbolized a contract that the pharaohs had made with the gods who came down here from Sirius, from the from the ancient star system of Sirius. They were called, and Sirius is called the dog star. And consequently, you take dog, D-O-G, and turn it around for us, it becomes God. G-O-D is dog spelled backwards. It goes back to Sirius, the dog star. It goes back to Anubis in, in the Egyptian. So that the, the Ark of the Contract became known as the Ark of the Covenant. No, it's the Ark of the Contract, and it was a thousand years before Hebrews ever had it. Consequently, when you understand our symbolism and theology and religion, uh, you come to find out that we have been sold a bill of goods on so much. <clears throat> and why do, you have, uh, why do you have these institutions that, that 
the religion, philosophy, politics, all of these systems are institutions which are being financed, organized, and directed by the people who mean to put you into bonds and chains. God has created all of the animals to be free. He created everything. God has, who, who has created all things. Freedom is the one thing that you see everywhere except for man. And consequently, the real freedom in man is up here. Consequently, the old Hiram Mann, the first governor of the state of California, Hiram Mann said, I think it was Hiram Mann that said, when no man is safe, when freedom fails, the best men rot in filthy jails, while those who cry to appease appease are hung by those they tried to please. Meaning that there can never be uh, <clears throat> a common cause with darkness. There is no place in, for light dealing with darkness. You have to know the truth and seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's an old adage, but it's true. The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become, and you begin to see lies everywhere. And now you're in tune with God, and now you can begin to see where things have come from and where they're going. Uh, let me uh, show you a few slides, because I got tons of them, and you don't have to put that in right now. No, I just got that just in case something were to happen. Okay. So let's assume that it's not going to. Never assume anything. Yeah, I know that. Last time I did, I was wrong. Okay. Look, let me just give you some examples of the kind of thing I'm talking about, that things that we see every day and we don't realize where they've come from. <clears throat> Now, this is the uh, Ark of God. Uh, you'll see this is the New York State Seal. In New York, the uh, State of New York Seal, you will see in the middle is the Lost Ark of the Covenant. Here it is, the Ark of the Covenant. You remember this from Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark? And uh, here it is again. <clears throat> Incidentally, the uh, ark, the box itself, represented the female, uh, the female, the ability to give life. And so the priest would drop blood in front of the ark, representing the menstrual cycle of the female because it had, again, to do with sex. So we see uh, bringing the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, okay? Now, from Smith's Bible Dictionary, we're given to understand that the, the box with the handles and the angel's wings, etc., uh, Smith's Bible Dictionary, in Smith's Bible Dictionary, look up the word ark. thought I had a larger. Anyway, the word was adopted from the Egyptian. There's an Egyptian ark. It goes on to say that the ark was an ark of the contract in Egypt, which was copied later by the Hebrews and called the Ark of the Covenant. Here's a dictionary of the Bible, another one. And there again. You look up the word ark, and it will tell you it was an Egyptian ark. The Egyptians had and came up with the idea of a sacred ark. <clears throat> there is the ark that was found in King Tutankhamun's uh, tomb when they found the tomb of King Tut. And there is uh, King Tutankhamun's ark that was found in his tomb. Here it is again. You will see the Egyptians carrying uh, the ark. Again, you will see um, at the top left, they're carrying the, the Holy Ark. This is the Egyptian, not Hebrew. This is a thousand years before Hebrews were ever even near Egypt. They had the lost Ark. Now, <clears throat> uh, here's an interesting, uh, well, wait a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself because I want to jump around a little bit. 
on that first one, I'm going to, um, I'm not going to go through all of these. I want to jump around a little bit. I just wanted to show you that to give you an example of the arc. Now, the next one. The next one is Solomon's Temple. We're told about King Solomon's Temple. Incidentally, there was no King Solomon. So don't look for King Solomon in history because there was no King Solomon. That's the word Sol Om On. S O L is the sun in Latin. In Latin, the word sun is S O L, Sol. And in the Hindu, the Hindu priest of the sun, they call the sun Om. Remember the priest of Om? They chant Om. And On is the city of the sun. The Greeks call it Heliopolis. It's called Heliopolis to this day. But the Egyptians, Helios, Opolis. Heliopolis means the city of the sun. The city of the sun, Heliopolis in Greek, was originally called in the Egyptian on. Look it up in any dictionary. O-N. That's why when you walk into a room, you flip a switch on. Because on was the city of the sun in Egypt. So the three words for the sun in the three esoteric languages of the world is Sol, Om, and On. Solomon. And Saul Oman's temple, you will see the temple of Solomon. The word here used for the, well, that's, all right. This is uh, the word used for any oily substance in the Old Testament in the Hebrew is shemen or semen. Strong's Bible Concordance uh, has its saying, it is very suggestive of the old Hebraic writings that when we find the oil of anointing for phallic pillars, priests and kings, was called sema, the word used by the Romans and our medical men for the uh, fluid of the male. Consequently, this, this is where we get the word Christos, the oil. Now, here is a ground plan for the Temple of Solomon, Solomon's Temple. And now we're hearing so much about how uh, the fraternities are wanting to, uh, in the Middle East, want to rebuild Solomon's temple. Well, you better look at this because it's not what you think it is. Solomon's temple. There's a ground plan for the temple. Now, if you look at Solomon's temple, that had two pillars at the gate. At the entrance, it was Bo Jachin and Boaz. Jachin and Boaz, look at the, the ground plan for Solomon's temple. Here's what it really is. You'll see the male phallic, and it's within the female. So the whole temple of Solomon, the holy is, is the male phallic, and the most holy is the head of the penis, and it goes into the female, which is called the temple of Solomon, the temple of life. And consequently, Solomon's temple was merely a representation of the sex act. Now here we have, uh, yeah, down at the bottom it's showing the same thing. So this is why you will find on churches a big phallic. So when you drive by churches, you see these things, they're called colonnades. Colonnade. Incidentally, that's why Colin Powell, uh, ABC News, uh, about a year ago, said, uh, it was interesting, they said Colin Powell his actual real name was Collins Powell, Collins Powell. But all the politicians around Washington, D.C. thought he was so full of it, they called him Colin Powell. That's where he gets it, Colin Powell. And that, that is a representation of the male phallic, and it's on a church. Again, this is why you priests have to go to a seminary. Here it is again. Here's another temple. You can tell the layout of the temple. <clears throat> no, that's not Bill Clinton. This is a. This is a. Uh, this is a uh, Egyptian god named Min. 
M-I-N. And you'll see the Egyptians climbing the pole. It's called the ceremony of climbing the pole of men. The pole, of course, is the representation of the male phallic. One of the most important is that of the maypole. This relic of pagan tree worship originated, originally represented the cosmic axis and the phallic power of the sky god. And here are dancing around the maypole and have no idea in the world that women are dancing around the male phallic. And I think, uh, and yeah, and the Christians once a year in September have something called see you at the pole and have no idea in the world that it's the same old idea of see you at the pole dancing around the male phallic. These are called scepters of power. These are symbols of male power. <laughs> yeah, that's what it means. So when you see these symbols in their hands, it represents the dominance of the world by the male sexual principle. Okay? Hmm. Okay. Even the playing cards like the jack has. That's why it's called a jack. It goes back to the Bible, jack and the pole. And here, here's something we call the pillar of life. You'll see these two pillars. There are always two pillars representing the male phallic in the old ancient Phoenician Canaanite system. There are always two phallic. You'll see them there. There we have the sacred stone phallic pillars. Always you will see the now, these were penis head gods in Assyria. There were always two of them. In India, in Japan, in Rome, Pompeii, in Islam. You'll see the two phallic pillars on both sides. Incidentally, the churches and many of the old architecture in the Middle East and churches today all have pointed glass windows long pointed glass windows and pointed do arch doors. The pointed glass windows represent the female opening, the pointed arch. And, of course, the twin phallic pillars. And you see it everywhere. Here we have the body of Osiris. Let's see, the sky is supported on the bottom line. It says the sky is supported by two phallic pillars. And you see that everywhere. Incidentally, the Washington Monument is a phallic symbol. And it connects, it's the male phallic, and it connects to the female ovaries, the oval office. The Egyptian idea, the Egyptian convention of twin phallic pillars at the temple gate was copied by the temple at Jerusalem where the right pillar was named Jachin, God makes him firm, and the left pillar was named Boaz, eagerness and strength. What are we talking about? Jachin makes him firm and eagerness and strength? That's in the Bible, First Kings. The Temple of Solomon represented sex, period. And there are the, the temples. There it is again. You'll see the temple and the two phallic pillars and Solomon's temple. There they are, Jackin and Boaz, two male phallic pillars in front of the temple. Incidentally, that's where the word temple comes from, the house of God or the house of El, a temp El, the house of El, the house of the God of Saturn, the temp El. And on all the temp Els, you always had the twin phallic pillars. There it is in downtown, on Wilshire in downtown Los Angeles, the synagogue <coughs> has the two phallic pillars. You see it all over the world. All over the earth you see twin phallic pillars going all the way back to the Phoenician Canaanites. This is over in Pasadena at the, uh, uh, at the British Israel Masonic uh, Ambassador College. What is that? 
What is the symbolism there? Anybody, uh, am I the only one seeing what the symbolism there? There's the king with his phallic symbol on both sides of the... Now, pipes were also, the musical instruments, both flute and reed pipes, had a place in primitive fertility rites owing to the phallic appearance. And uh, the second line goes on to say, um, singles and double pipes, among other instruments, are depicted in the Mes Mesopotamian art from the third century millennium. And then it was also adopted into Christian theolo theology. So pipes were, where does it show that it was a phallic? Yeah, the third line down on the pipe, as a symbol of male sexuality, it occurs in Greco-Roman and Renaissance art. And so the pipes, this is why we have something called a male organ, the male organ, the twin pipes. So when you, you know, when you see the Mormon church with the male organ, just remember that's what it all means. That's where it came from, the twin phallic pipes. Now, Enough of that is enough. We're going to the next one. Um, again, while I'm, while I'm doing this, is I'm showing you how things we think we understand and we're used to seeing never even occurred to you what these things mean. Let's see. This one goes from 27. All right. Okay. As far back as the ancient petroglyphs with the sun symbol, this is from the Bronze Age. This goes back thousands of years. You will see carved on stones in, uh, in Russia and all over Europe as, uh, an interesting symbol. It's, it's the symbol of the sun, petroglyphs with the sun symbol. So that's an ancient, going back to the Bronze Age. Um, <coughs> You will see this ancient sun symbol. This is the Nordic sun symbol. The cross on the circle. This is why, incidentally, you drive by churches today. You know, you'll see many churches have the big cross and a circle in the middle. The circle in the middle is the sun, the sun that dies on the cross of the zodiac between north, east, south, and west. Incidentally, if you take north, east, west, and south, that spells news. Anything that happens in the world is news, north, east, west, and south. Um, anyway, let's go on with this. Here it is again. The old ancient prehistoric symbol of the sun. Going back to the old Phoenician Canaanites, this is Sumerian. Sumerians actually had the, uh, the same symbol. The uh, Buddhists and the Hindus in India have the symbol. The Aztecs and the Mayas had it. It's everywhere. A cross in the middle of a circle. One of the oldest symbols in the world for the sun. This is in Iraq. This is in Jerusalem. This is in a, a synagogue in Jerusalem. Here it is again. Always is the cross in the circle. And showing that children are taught to pray to the cross in the circle, which goes back to the old ancient Phoenician. And that uh, even, even prior to the ancient Phoenician goes back to, and here's the host with the cross on it, the circle. It's an ancient formula. And I said, yeah, I'll bet it's an ancient formula. It's real ancient. Far more ancient than you would suspect. On uh, the caps of the French used to carry it. That's in Freemasonry. Churches. Rosicrucians. The Queen. 
Queen Mum. There's Queen Mum with the uh, symbol of the cross. This ancient, ancient sun cross of the ancient, most ancient people of the world. And today it's still being used all over the world and people have no idea in the world where it came from. Even the Nazis, you'll see the Nazis had the sun cross. Nazis with their sun cross. Now, while, while this may not seem very important, you need to understand the reason why it's important is because, and this will only be just a moment, even the Pope wears the sun cross. There it is again at the Vatican. You need to ask yourself, how come the old ancient petroglyph from thousands and thousands, probably anywhere from 10 to 15,000 years ago, the old prehistoric world marked the symbol of the sun as a... It's the same way that it is now at the Vatican. Is there a message here or what? So when you talk about God's Son being the light of the world, you better look at it because there's something else going on here. Oh, I'm sorry. this. This is number five. Yeah, this is number five. Okay. Okay, yes. <clears throat> now, we're talking about the law before, and Moses is the lawgiver. Actually, the word Moses uh, is a Egyptian word, and in the ancient Egyptian language, the word Moses meant the son of. Like in Hebrew today, ben, B-E-N, means in Hebrew, the son of. So like Judah Ben-Hur, Judah was the son of, his father's last name was Hur, H-U-R, Judah Ben-Hur, or Ben, B-E-N, means the son of. Incidentally, if you look up in the Hebrew encyclopedia, look up the word Hur, because I did that for Judah Ben-Hur, H-U-R, is a Hebrew spelling of Horus. The sun god Horus was called in Hebrew Hur, H-U-R. So when the sun came up in the morning, Horus was our newborn son, and he took 12 steps across heaven. He would call Horus's, H-O-U-R-S, Horus. And he took 12 steps. That's where we get a 12-step program for alcoholics, a 12-step program when you go to school. You start in the first grade and you end up in the 12th grade. It's a 12-step program because the ancient Egyptians said that the son, whose name was Horus, when he was risen in the morning with our risen Savior, he walked across the sky in 12 steps, and each one was a, hor a different Horus. The first one was Horus of the first step, Horus of the second step, Horus of the third step, and going down the line, Horus of the 12th step. So there were 12 different Horuses, and consequently, we took the word Horus, H-O-R-U-S, and turned it around and make it H-O-U-R-S. So it's 12 hours. No, 12 hours is just ch chained in the U and the R and Horus. So the 12 Horuses are the 12 steps in heaven, uh, which are the 12 hours of day. And consequently, the sun brought light into the world. And in Latin, the sun or light in Latin is Lucius, uh, Lucius, Lucifer, Lus, Lux, Lucius, all mean in Latin light. This is why you have Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker is Lucius walking across the sky 
and he's doing battle with the prince of darkness whose name in the Egyptian was Set, S-E-T, because they noticed it got dark at sunset. And consequently, God's son was chasing that evil uh, prince of darkness until he died at the twelfth step, and then he's gone, and he leaves the world in the hands of the prince of darkness. And his name was Set. And of course, it does get dark at sunset. Now, keeping all that in mind, we have uh, the law, the Mosaic law. Volcanoes are very important now in, this, uh, in the Mosaic Law. A lot of people don't know the, the connection between a volcano and the Mosaic Law. Well, let me show you. Volcanoes, like any other impressive and fearful aspect of nature, volcanoes have been the object of worship for human beings in the earliest Stone Age. Yet the original Yahweh seems to have become begun as a volcano god also, Mount Sinai, incidentally. Um, <clears throat> the moon god in the old Phoenician Canaanite system, the moon god in Cana was called Sin, S-I-N. That was the name of the moon god. And in the ancient Phoenician Canaanite language, which we today call Hebrew, Hebrew is actually the Phoenician Canaanite language, um, the word for a mountain is Ai. In the ancient Phoenician Canaanite, Ai was a word for the mountain. So the mountain of the moon god was, the moon god was Sin, and the mountain is Ai. So they put it together and become Sinai. Mount Sinai is nothing more than the mountain of the moon god, which, you know, I don't care. Uh, if you think that's holy, fine. But there's nothing holy in Israel. There ain't never been nothing holy in Israel. There's nothing holy in Rome. There's nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There's nothing holy in Rome, and there sure as hell is nothing holy in Mecca. All of this is a play on words and terms, and that's why you can call out to God, and all the nations of the world can call out to the divine to protect you and to protect your country, and there's no protection coming. God did not step in to save the Jews from Hitler, and it does not appear that God's doing anything to step in to save this country. Why? Because like Thomas Jefferson says, I fear for this country when I remember that God is just. Meaning that until you get yourself in line with truth and until you've got this correctly understood the divine presence in the universe and what is truth, and until you do that, don't call out to God. I remember how in the, in the book of Isaiah, when the scripture says, don't call, when what? No, the scripture says in Isaiah, God saying to the, the people, when what you dread comes upon you as pregnant pains upon a pregnant woman, as pains of distress upon a pregnant woman, when what you dread comes upon you like pains of, of distress on a pregnant woman, do not call out to me to help you. Do not call out because I will not be found. Quite simply meaning, until you get your theology and your life in tune with the divine universe and that divine universal God force in the universe, until you start getting yourself in tune with the real truth of who God is and who created this universe and how it all came into being, until you're ready to do that, don't call out to God for anything. Because God is going to do whatever he's going to do, but just make sure you don't get in the way thinking that you're doing something wonderful and come to find out, no, you're part of the problem. You haven't done your homework. And that's what I've been telling people for years. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. I'm telling you, do your homework. Because I am totally convinced that there is a very powerful divine presence in the universe that I myself refer to as God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And consequently, I have a high respect for that divine presence in the universe, and I think we need to get in tune with it, because that's the only thing that's going to save us. Our leaders are not leaders, they're misleaders. Yet the original Yahweh seems to have begun as a volcano god. Mount Sinai, <clears throat> where Moses encountered him, was the seat of a Midianite god who formerly had dwelt in the volcano. He was also identified, Yahweh was also identified with the local moon god, Sin, after whom the mountain was named. The appearance of Yahweh is a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. 
certainly suggest a volcano spirit. The Bible says in Exodus that Yahweh appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That's true. There's the holy mountain with the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Here we have Israel at Sinai dedicated itself to Yahweh. And what do you see? Does that look like a volcano to you? Here's another one. Jehovah led the sons of Israel to a mountain named Sinai in the desert. He gave them his law. Does that look like a volcano to you? The magnificence of Yahweh. These are just some scriptures talking about the volcano God. I'm going to go past these uh, quotes. These are all quoting... Um, from the Bible how Jehovah was the fire or oh, here it is again now this is in the Bible um, thunder is called in Hebrew kolach voices for it is considered the voice of God thunder is called voices for it is considered the voice of God so when you hear that Moses went up into the mountain and heard the voice of God I can imagine and he came down with his face glowing, I would respectfully suggest that the whole mountain is glowing. I could see why your face would be glowing if you were going up on the side of a volcano. Lightning can be symbolized by an arrow, obviously. Here in the Bible, in Job 37, under Job 38, but this is actually the footnotes for Job 37, it says, the storm, the clouds, are God's tent, gathered as the thunder or the voice of Yahweh roars. They descend and God shoots the arrows of his lightning. Later, and it's called the mist. In the Hebrew Torgrims, it's literally, the mist is his smoke, his thunderbolts. The linear correct translation in Hebrew is God thunders wonderfully with his voice. So we're talking about lightning and thunder. Here it is again, Mount Sinai. Look like a volcano to you? Here is the, the, the uh, children of Israel running away. Incidentally, why do we call them, the, the, why do we say that, the children of Israel? Why do we say that, children of Israel, when, when our children are called kids? Kids are baby goats. You have kids. They're called the children of Israel. We have kids. Mount Sinai, does that look like a volcano to you? Here is Moses. Incidentally, Moses takes the law and he throws it down and breaks it. He was the first lawbreaker. So you don't want to be breaking the law. Does that look like a volcano to you? There's one Hebrew telling another one, that's a volcano, Airhead. See it? There's Moses up in the volcano. Here is from the Encyclopedia Judica, one page that gives the symbols for each one of the holidays, like Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, um, Hanukkah, Feast of Purim, the Passover, and the Feast of the Giving of the Law is in the lower right. The Feast of the Giving of the Law. There it is. The Feast of the Giving of the Law. Does that look like a volcano to you? Huh? Now, <clears throat> here's part two, and if you know where I'm going with this, don't comment. Let me go there, <clears throat> because a lot of you will jump ahead and know where I'm going with this. The word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan, or Vulcanus, derived from the old Christian deity Vulcanus. Very important. The word volcano comes from the Latin volcano god Vulcan. Here is Vulcan, the volcano god, <clears throat> with his lightning bolts. Now, part two. In the Hebrew tradition, uh, you have the, something called the benediction. Now, the Pope, when he blesses, makes a sign of the cross. But in the Hebrew, the, the uh, rabbis bless the congregation, which, which is called the, the benediction symbol. And so the benediction has been used, the benediction or the blessing. Here, the Pentateuch scroll crown with the hands raised in a priestly blessing. Here in uh, downtown Los Angeles, you will see the uh, 
the Hebrew priests giving the priestly blessing. This is called, and here, indeed the Lord is high, and yet he looks upon the lowly, and you will see the priestly blessing. Again, the black robe for the planet Saturn and Yahweh connected to the volcano god Vulcan. This is why Mr. Spock is a Vulcan. The rabbi and Mr. Spock. It's all Jewish religion, Hollywood, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And the Gentiles just love it. Can't get enough of Hollywood. Can't get enough of it. And that's why God has withheld his protection from our nation. This is why our country is now in the darkest period as has ever been because we have given ourselves over to ignorance, stupidity, ill-informed religious philosophies and have not come before God with a trite heart and wanting to know the full truth. Here we're told about the manna from heaven. I don't know if you've ever remember Moses was uh, leading the children of Israel to pick manna from heaven. They would find manna from heaven on the ground each morning, the scripture says. Here they are picking up the manna from heaven on the ground each morning. Here in Exodus <clears throat> 16, 14, it says, And when the dew that lay on the ground was gone up, behold, the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as hoarfrost on the ground. So now we know, and the next one in 15 says, And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to each other, to one another, it is manna, for they did not know what it was. In Hebrew, manna simply means, what is it? I mean, they tried this stuff and said, God, what is this stuff? You know? So what is it? They don't know. Well, what is it in Hebrew is manna. So they call it manna. Well, what is manna? The manna from heaven was a small round thing. And it says when the dew that was on the ground, of course, when the sun comes up, it evaporates. And behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing. <clears throat> Mana, meaning Hebrew, what is it? It had seven characteristics from the old ancient world. Small, round, wafer-like, sweet, could be hard, can be melted, and it was obviously from heaven. Because when you ate the mana, you could talk to God. Well, now we found out mana was a small, round thing, mushrooms. And here are the priests of, of Israel. Here's the Hebrew priest of Israel wearing a mushroom on his head the mushroom headdress. I've often wondered, see, because the mushrooms were hallucinogenic, uh, a hallucinogenic drug. <clears throat> and I've often wondered, is that why they call the priest high priest? <laughs> the sacred mushroom, the key to the door of eternity, the search for the sacred plant of the ancients used to send the mind to another world and into the future. Let me tell you something. I've never tried any drug in the world ever. Not pot, nothing. Ever. However, I am not so stupid as to not be well informed about the potentials for the mushroom. The magic mushroom, from all indication, is a sincerely important discovery that was made in the ancient and prehistoric world. This stuff works. The magic mushroom and, and, and other uh, uh, hallucinogenic drugs like that do something to the electromagnetic forces in the brain to open up your mind and open up your spirit to all kinds of profound things that you're just totally not aware of. So. While this is a hallucinogenic drug, nonetheless, this is a very important stuff here. Magic mushrooms are not to be laughed at. It is not a light thing. This stuff is very serious stuff. And that particular kind of mushroom is called a uh, Amonita muscara. The sacred mushroom in the cross, John Allegro, the, man, the third man in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls, wrote, wrote this book. The sacred mushroom in the cross. A study of the nature and origins of Christianity within the fertility cults of the ancient Near East by John Allegro. 
John Allegro was the number three man appointed by the State of Israel, England, and America in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The top three men that were picked in the beginning were all fired because of what they said was in the Dead Sea Scrolls that was not supposed to be said. All, all three men were fired. <coughs> there is the Am Amanita Muscara. Here in the catacombs of Rome under the Vatican you will find uh, paintings in the old catacombs of Amanita Muscara being the sacred tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, the whole concept is if you take the, 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 the mushroom, it opens up your mind to all kinds of off-the-wall things. And of course, you can talk to God. Here's a, here's a small group of mushroom heads. Here's another bunch of them. <laughs> the chump there with the big beard looks like he's been on it for a while. Some more mushroom heads. There they are. So when you see these uh, mushroom headdress, just remember that's where it comes from, mushrooms. The high priest and all of the ancient world, all of them took mushrooms. Okay? So that's it on that. And there it is, the high priest of Israel with the mushroom. Now, Okay. Here you will see the headdress. The Pope's headdress is called the Pope's mitre. The word mitre comes from the word in the Catholic Encyclopedia, the word mitre for the Pope's headdress. Mitre comes from the word Mithra because Mithra was the god of Rome before the, the Vatican became the Vatican. Uh, Mithra, Mithraism was the worship that was going on in the Roman Empire. Now, the headdress is called the Pope's mitre. A lot of people do not know where that headdress came from. It actually goes back to the Hebrew. Because here is an old wood carving picture of Christ before Caiaphas, the, the, the Hebrew uh, judge, and Jesus is being brought before Caiaphas. And you will see on Caiaphas the papal headdress. And incidentally, you'll see that uh, moon in front of the headdress, that's the symbol of the moon, the moon god, Sin. This is why today uh, you can still go to what is called a Sin Agog. Sin Agog is the mountain of the moon god, Sin, Sin Ai, or Sin Agog. But again, the headdress is Hebrew. Why? Because, and this is very important, the ancient world believed that one of the gods, the most important god, was a fish god. And remember Amos and Andy with king fish? Yeah, the fish god. This is why today even Christians still have fish on the car. It goes back to the old ancient Phoenician, Canaanite, Babylonian fish god, Dagon. Dagon the fish god. Most Christians driving around with fish on, on, their, on, their, on their cars have no idea in the world why they got a fish with a symbol. It goes back to the fish god, Dagon. This is in the old Assyrian system. He was called Anis, the fish god. The Assyrian, again, Dagon, the chief god of the, of the Philistines was Dagon, from which we get Dragon. Dagon, the fish god. You'll see he's wearing the fish on his head. Here are the priests of Dagon. This is why the Pope wears, you see, the fish head. The fish head of Dagon, the old pagan fish god of the Phoenician Canaanite, ancient Phoenician Canaanite, Assyrian, Babylonian, Sumerian worship of the fish god. So when you see the Pope, just remember that headdress is the old is the worship of a very ancient pagan god. Here it is again. The fish head.
Here are the black robes. Why black robes? Why black squares? The black robe is the black robe of the planet Saturn. Again, here are the here are the judges all swearing allegiance in Nazi Hitler. And here are the priests in. Uh, incidentally, these uh, the priest uniform is called. Here it is. Just a minute. All black robes. Why black robes? Darth Vader wears a black robe. Yeah, devil worshippers wear black robes. Ayatollah Kakamami wears a black robe. Yeah. Yeah, Omar Gaddafi wears one too. There they are. Some of the most bloodletting murderers the world has ever seen. The Order of the Garter. In England, you will see Churchill on the lower right. It's called the Order of the Garter. The black robes, a very, very extremely powerful secret society in England called the Order of the Garter. Many people think it's like a woman's garter. No, no, it was the guards who guarded the powers in England. They guard the powers. They are like a mafia, underworld organization. A very powerful secret society with the black robes and the red strips. The red <coughs> represents... The same thing as the red, the scarlet-colored wild beast of Revelation. The red is very important, and you'll see they're also wearing this, the old ancient symbol of the cross. Yeah, Mussolini and the fascists, they also have black uniforms. This particular uniform, this particular robe the priest wears is called a Geneva robe. Geneva. <clears throat> the reason why it's called a Geneva robe is because the Vatican has dominated Europe for some 2,000 years, and Europe has dominated the world. And therefore, international maritime admiralty law, the law of international banks, is based on Vatican canon law. This is why the Vatican has a Swiss guard. The Swiss guard guard the Pope. Why? Because it's symbolic. The Switzerland, which is the home of international banking, is guarding the Pope because he's the boss of all bosses. Michael Corleone goes to the Pope, right? Mafia bows before the Pope. International drug traders bow before the Pope. The Pope is probably one of the most fierce diabolical people the world has ever known. I know. I was born and raised Catholic. I listened to my uncles who were federal judges. I listened to my Uncle Joe. I listened to the people I've read and studied for 42 years. The Vatican is a symbol of world criminal, world empire. And if the Protestants think that they have protested against Rome and gotten something cleaner and better, you've got another thing coming because 99% of Protestantism came directly out of the Vatican Catholic Church and neither one of them are worth a damn before God. Somebody had better start doing their homework and understanding that we have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. And I am totally committed to trying to help people to learn and see how these symbols have been foisted on us and we didn't even know it. You see Heaven's Gate. Remember this idiot? Heaven's Gate. A gate is a door. I'll run through this very quick. A door or a gateway is an entrance to the realm of the dead. And the Shinto, they have the Heaven's Gate. And I'll run through this very quickly, but it's important. You'll see there's the sun door, the sun gate in Egypt. And the old Aztec, Mayas, and Incas had the heaven's gate of the sun door. The universal belief that the sun, of, that the sun door of immortality represented the monolithic gateway of the sun. There's the heaven's door, the heaven's gate, the sun door. The consequently, the cold concept of the sun door was to go through the door into the world of the dead, into the occult world beyond. 
Here's the winged sun door in the Hindu. The sun doors. This goes all the way back to the Akkadian. Akkadian, Babylonian, Sumerian belief that the gods will lead you through heaven's gate or the sun door. There is the old Phoenician Canaanite god going through the sun door. Here in the Vatican you will see a colorful ceremony at the beginning of the holy year <clears throat> where the seal is broken on the holy door. <clears throat> with, uh, with only few, uh, fewer than 880 days left before Pope John Paul opens the holy door for the Jubilee year of 2000. One of the most solemn events in the church's calendar is the opening of the holy door. Here is the Pope going through the sun gate, the holy door. The Pope immediately after entering the basilica through the holy door, the sun gate, the old Phoenician Canaanite Assyrian sun door. This stuff is as ancient and as pagan as it has ever been. And most people see this and have no idea. They think it's supposedly, they think it's, people see something like this on television. Oh, it's very holy. The only thing holy in Rome is the stories. They're full of holes. The concept is the whole thing is nothing but a story. And it has been misrepresented. And again, let me say, I am totally convinced that the New Testament is a profoundly important story, but it has been misrepresented by the people who are far smarter than we are. They have put all of this stuff together and they figured we'd never find out. Well, I've taken 42 years of my life to go through this material and I haven't even scraped the surface. I could go on for weeks talking about this kind of thing. The point I'm making here is that we need to wake up and find out what these symbols mean. I think this is uh, getting where, yeah, here it is, Rome. Rome in the first century. I don't know if you know this, but in the first century Rome, Rome's seat of power, where Caesar ruled from, was called Capitoline Hill. Capitoline Hill. And the temple of Juno Monita was a part of Capitoline Hill, Juno Monita, uh, which is where we get Juno, Alaska. Juno Monita is where we get the word Monita, is where we get the word money. It's because of this is where Caesar coined his money in the temple of Juno Monita on uh, money. So, of course, Caesar, before he went in, before the quote, Senate, end quote, he had to go to the bankers had to go to the temple to see what the bankers want before he goes into the Senate. There is Capitoline Hill. It's up on the hill. We still say that today. The president's up on the hill. Not realizing when you see the president of the United States up on the hill, this is all Rome. Okay. One last one. <clears throat> yeah, domes. Domes are very important. The word dome comes from a Latin word domus. Domus gives us domesticated, dominate, Dominican Republic, domineering, domus. Domas meaning the presence of the divine. Domas. The presence of God. The presence of divine. Domas. And you'll find domes everywhere. Churches have domes. Religious buildings incorporate a dome. The Vatican, dome. St. Peter's, domas. Here we have from a publication showing Jesus giving the keys to Peter, the keys of heaven, the two keys. And you will see in the back the Vatican. 
Domas. So Jesus is giving the keys to Peter for him to rule through the Domas. Now why is this important? It's because, in point of fact, the United States uh, government has the same identical dome as the one in Vatican. Identical. It's because this government is dominated by international maritime admiralty law, the law of international banks. International maritime admiralty law is based on Vatican canon law. Vatican canon law is the law of banks and money. And consequently, that's why the Pope has a Swiss guard. Switzerland is the bankers of the world. Consequently, you need to understand what these symbols mean. Let's see if there's something else on here. No. Yeah, there it is, a mortarboard derived from a cap worn by Roman Catholic clergy. A mortarboard is now a symbol. The red square, yeah, these are squares. Here's the Pope bowing before a mafia. Yeah, you gotta ask yourself, how come the Pope has to bow to get the square on his head? Better, you better check this out and figure out why does the Pope have to bow to politicians? The square, the red square. Isn't that what uh, where, where Russia was, uh, the Moscow was ruled from? The red square? The red square. You find that in the Vatican, the red square. The Nazis used the red square. I mean, even Union Bank uses the red square. And incidentally, the Union Bank goes back to Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler founded a bank with the, with the gold he got from Jews. He founded a bank called the German All, the Reichstag All German Union Bank the Reichstadt All-German Union Bank. Today, the Reichstadt All-German Union Bank is known in our country as Union Bank. Union Bank was founded by Adolf Hitler. But don't, you know, but don't take this personal, it's just business, understand? <laughs> you know, here is a red shield, red shield, Rothschild, and what do you see as a symbol of fascism? That is, fascism was an authoritarian political movement. Uh, the last sentence, it says, its name was derived from a fascist, a Roman symbol for authority consisting of a bundle of rods and an ax. Political life, in most cases, fascists have come to power after a nation has suffered an economic collapse, a military defeat, or some other disaster. The fascist party wins mass support by promising to revive the economy and restore national pride. Say it again. Win. Okay. Political life under fascism. In most cases, fascists have come to power after a nation has suffered an economic collapse, a military defeat, or some other disaster. The fascist party wins mass support by promising to revive the economy and restore national pride. Where have we heard this crap before? The people running this country are nothing but the patsies for international, international fascist Nazism. They are fascist murderers all. And one day, there's going to come a time when the divine justice is going to be having its way on this earth, and people like George Bush and all of the other fascist, Nazi, underworld, mafiosi murderers are going to bite the dust. You can bet on it. God has watched the coming and going of Hitler's for thousands of years, and it hasn't impressed him a bit. And the, ma and the people that are running this government today they're on their way out too, very soon.
personal liberty. Personal liberty is severely limited on, under a fascist government. Here is a fasci. You'll see it underneath. It's everywhere throughout the world, especially in South America, Italy, France, Italy again, Benito Mussolini. You'll see the fasci. Fascism and the of Italian domination. Here's Kurt Volheim, fascist Nazi, ended up being the head of the United Nations. I don't know what that tells you about the UN. And here's the Pope with his fascist Nazi friend. Both of them are grinning because they both know what they're doing, and they know you don't know what they're doing. And that's why they're both smiling. I put the Pope in the same place with Adolf Hitler and the other fascist Nazis. I know. I've done 42 years of research on the Roman system of fascism, Nazism, and I can tell you the papacy is the bottom line if you want to talk about fascism. Why is it, why does the Pope wear a Jewish yarmulke? You ever thought about that? Where's the Jewish yarmulke? Why? Here at the Vatican, Cardinal Pacelli, who later became Pope Pius XII, he signs a concordance. Eugenio Pacelli, now Vatican Secretary of State, presides over the signing of a concordat between Germany and the Vatican in 1933. The Vatican signed contracts with the Nazis. They were called, there were two of them. They were called concordances. Now, how many people know that? The Pope signs contracts with Adolf Hitler. Here's Benito Mussolini and the Vatican signing contracts with the Vatican. Again, here's another cardinal meeting with all of the fascists on the left. Here are the priests hailing Hitler. Here's Pacelli. Now here's the Cardinal Nuncio, Papal Nuncio in Germany talking to Adolf Hitler. Again, the fasci. Here it is on American coins, the fasci. Here it is in Rome. Take a good look at the fasci on, the, on, it, on that symbol. Here it is in America. Here it is on the American dime. It's a traditional symbol of republicanism, a fasci as its symbol. Now, Republicans have always used the fasci because they crawl on their knees before the Pope and the Mafia. You see on both sides of the podium, fasci's. That's a fasci. And you'll see it with the president and on both sides of the podium. We can have the lights now. <clears throat> so in conclusion, let me say that what I'm trying to do is alert you and make you aware of the fact that the entire world operates on symbols, words, terms, emblems, national coats of arms, halotry, flags, and for many years I have been fascinated with how much Americans don't know about symbols and they look at them every day. I haven't got the faintest idea what these things mean. The religious institutions that govern the Western world are as corrupt as any institution that's ever come out of the Western world. But I believe that there is a very powerful story encoded symbolically in the Old and New Testament, but it has been misrepresented. And unless and until we are ready to accept that fact that there's something in the New Testament that you don't know, there's a symbolism there that's telling you something. And I am fascinated with how much uh, we read things and don't know what we're reading. Let me give you one last example um, that I think is important and will make the point. On the first day of summer, 
the sun is as high in the northern sky as it's going to get. It's not going any further north than the first day of summer. It is directly overhead as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to get. A each day, from the first day of summer, each day it moves imperceptibly. It moves one degree southward each day, moving, going southward. When it hits the halfway point, it is now crossing over the equator at the halfway point, and now it is going to fall. And that's why we call it fall, or autumn. Fall, because the sun is now falling. It's going. And consequently, it keeps moving until it hits the halfway point, which it crosses over the equator. Now it is the spring in the southern uh, uh, equator, and in the northern hemisphere, it is now fall, coming of winter. But in, as I said, but in Rio and in Brazil, it is now spring because it's going to go three more months until it hits the last, the first day of winter. And the first day of winter, the sun is as low in the, in the southern sky as it's going to get. And that's the first day of, of summer for Rio. That's why the birds and smart people with money fly south for the if you got money, you go south, follow the sun, right? So consequently, the sun, which, which was doing just fine, it was really hot and doing great, and then and when it reached the halfway point, the constellation that it hits every fall is the constellation of Scorpio. Scorpio is the constellation that begins autumn, and therefore it's this kiss of death. The scorpion has kissed God's son, and now he's going to be led to his death in Capricorn. He's going to die. He has fallen. The great son of God has fallen, and he's going to fall all the way down to the southern hemisphere until it hits the first day of winter, which is December 22nd. Yes. On December 22nd, the sun rises on the lowest latitude on the lowest point in the southern sky. Now follow what I'm saying. The sun rises on the lowest degree on the 22nd. On the 23rd, the sun rises on the same identical degree. It's so perceptive, the U.S. Navy has the instruments to tell you it did not move one degree south. It did not move one degree north. It's on the same identical degree. On the 24th, it rises, and it's still on the same identical degree. Therefore, they, the ancient Egyptians knew that, and they said God's son was dead for three days. And, but on the fourth day, which is December 25th, United States Navy devices will tell you that the sun moved one degree northward, one small degree northward. It's just enough because the ancient people said anything that was dead for three days and has just moved one degree northward is born again. It's come back to life. Now it is on its way back to the northern hemisphere. And consequently, when it gets to the next quarter point, which is spring, and at spring it crosses back over the equator on its way back to coming back to full grown and full into the northern hemisphere. Consequently, when, it, when you die today, we say the same thing the ancient Egyptians said. When someone dies, we say, grandmother passed last night. Grandfather passed away. Or uncle passed on. Always the word associated with death in the ancient world was passed. You passed last night. Grandmother passed on. But in the Egyptian, they said that when you died, you left from one world and went into another world. So you passed over into a next world. So when you died, they said, Grandfather passed over last night. And I've even heard that term. Grandmother passed over last night. Why? Because the sun, which was brilliant in, sun, uh, on, in the summer, it hit at halfway point, it crossed over the equator, so it passed over the equator, 
going to the full day of full summer in the southern hemisphere. In the spring, it's coming back and it passes over the equator again coming back. And in the ancient world, there was a celebration in the northern hemisphere because the sun, which was dead in winter, has been reborn on December 25th and has now come back to life. And they called it the Passover. So that the Passover is nothing more than the sun passing over the equator. The Passover. Okay? So consequently, when you're old, oh, a very holy, old, oh, the Passover. What are you talking about? Sun worship, airhead. Wake up. That's all it is. It's just worship of the sun passing over. And so consequently, the Passover happens on the first week of spring. Well, isn't that strange that it would happen in the first week of spring? Now, of course, Christians would not want to have anything to do with this because this is a Jewish uh, celebration of the Passover. So Christians wouldn't have anything to do with that. But we're still going to be worshiping the sun. But let's call it, let's say that um, instead of the Passover, let's say that God's son is, say, resurrected. Let's say he's resurrected and has come back to life. Well, the sun has been resurrected, has passed over. And so Christians go out on the first day of, of, of Easter, Ishtar, um, and have an Easter sunrise service. Why? Because that's all it is, is sun worship. You're worshiping the sun on a sunrise service because the sun has passed over, and the Jews call it Passover, Christians call it resurrection. Wake up, it's just sun worship. And until such time as you understand that God does not have anything to do with ignorance, that has nothing to do with the pagantry and all the crap that we have been fed by government, religion, politics, church, and all of it. It's all manipulation. What we need to understand is that there, there is a divine presence in the universe that demands justice and demands intelligence. And that's what I'm here to do, to help people to understand, to get back in tune with the divine nature of the universe. And I believe that that's going to be required very soon because when all the systems break down and the Christians for the first time begin to think about it, where is Jesus? I would have thought he would be back by now. You need to understand that there's a very powerful story in the New Testament that is telling us what God's thoughts are but you need to understand it is symbolic and there's a powerful story there. And one day, if I am invited back, I will do nothing more than for four hours do a whole theological discussion about the New Testament and the real story that's encoded in the New Testament because I believe it's a very powerful story, but it's not the one you think it is. So consequently, my last comments are I do not wish to offend, I wish to educate. Because I believe that's what the divine presence in the universe would want is true. Know the truth and it will set you free. And I want to thank you. Remember, just because you got questions, that does not necessarily mean I can answer them. Oh, thank you, thank you, Jordan. You've yeah. answered two two very important questions tonight. I now know what um, who Ohm refers to, O M M, in the movie T H X one one three eight. Mm -hmm. who George Lucas very, very cleverly put in as the, uh, the god of that whole society that they talked to and, and who they addressed. And I also now understand why there was a, a dome in the original uh, Daystar story, 
And I'll that. I now know why that was not allowed to ever make it to the screen. And you told me it probably wasn't ready. There was something missing. I now know what the dome means. And here I put it in there. I didn't even know what it meant. Right. Um, thank you. Now, I want to ask you, till the day star shines. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what Peter meant when he wrote that? Till and the maybe... day star rises in your heart. Mm -hmm. Peter said to, uh, to continue until the day star rises in your heart. The word day star, Lucifer. Lucifer is the day star. Lucifer is nothing more than the planet Venus. Go look it up in Encyclopedia Britannica. Lucifer is Venus. And Lucifer, being Venus, was the, was the light bringer. And the ancient Roman religion, that's actually based on the ancient Egyptian, just in the morning, the early morning, the priest in the city of On and all the ancient priests who were sun worshippers would go out at 4 o'clock in the morning, 3.30 to 4, and face the east, and when they would see the planet Venus rising, it's a beautiful, if you've ever been up at 4 o'clock in the morning to see Venus, it's magnificent. It's a beautiful, bright uh, sky <coughs> and, and the light in the sky. And the ancient peoples realized that when you see that star rising, the sun is right behind it. So it, it announced the coming of the sun. So it was a beautiful announcer for the sun was coming. And so it was called Lucifer. Lucifer was the bringer of the dawn, the bringer of the light. The, and it's called the day star. The day star is the star that brings the day, day star. Lucifer is nothing more than the planet Venus, period. Go look at any encyclopedia, go look up in any reference work, I don't care if it's Catholic, Protestant, any Bible reference work, it'll all tell you, all of them, they will tell you Lucifer is nothing more than the planet Venus. But it's highly symbolical and it means something. It means that light is coming into the world. But the scripture says that the light came into the world but the world was not worthy of it. Intellectual and spiritual enlightenment is trying to tell you something. And what happens when somebody is intellectually enlightened and trying to teach you something? Any, if, you are, if you're sleeping in bed and someone, you're sound asleep in bed and someone plot, uh, lights up a 600 watt bulb next to you, the first thing you're going to do is turn away. Why? Because it hurts your eye. You don't want to see it. And then you're going to be mad that somebody did that to you and woke you up with a 600 watt bulb. Why? Because intellectually, someone who is brilliant, who's trying to enlighten you, and you've been sleeping all your life, you're going to be offended that somebody has now caused you to have to think and, and giving you enlightenment. So consequently, that's what we see all the time. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. Lucifer is nothing more than the day star that brings the day. And it's been misused and misunderstood. Is there a virtuous day star? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Symbolically, there's a very powerful story in the symbolic symbolism of Lucifer, the day star, who brings the, the light of day. It's a very interesting and very important story, yes. We'll talk about it later. I just want to thank you for all this symbolism because I'm really into it because of my art background and flower of life. But I just wanted to get ask you quickly about, uh, I heard somebody mention on the radio about the Twin Towers, about Gemini, uh, oh, yeah. uh, something about the Gemini, the stars, uh, yeah, uh, the twins, twins yeah, uh, for the Gemini the, the and also 9-11, huh? Yeah. The, the twin phallic pillars, too, I was showing. Yeah, you. I, right yeah. away I thought it said Twin Towers when you were showing all the phallic signs. But I wanted to know if you could add anything on to that and also the 9-11. Yes, I will say this, that, uh, that we today in the Christian West believe that astrology is all of the devil, and actually the word devil is nothing more than the D put in front of the word evil. You write evil and put a D in front of it, it becomes devil. Devil, evil, and God is actually taking one of the O's out of good, and it becomes God. God is good and devil is evil. It's just use of words. But in point of fact, <clears throat> there is a very powerful symbolism in this double phallic symbol. And, and 
so what I'm saying is that we've been given to believe and understand that astrology is evil, is of the devil and all of that, and have nothing to do with it. Why? Because the church does not want you to discover the name of the tomb. The church does not want you to discover that for as far back as the human race goes, the kings, the rulers, the princes of the earth, all of the intellectuals, all of the most important people in the world know that the whole universe operates around the God's divine plan of the ages. It's astrology is from God. That's from the Bible. And consequently, until we have the proper respect for original astrological concepts, we're never going to figure out what these symbols mean and what, why we're in the trouble we are today. Astrology is a very powerful symbol. And it was used by the ancient Hebrews. It was used by the ancient Christians. And why do you, why do you think uh, uh, you have in the Bible, the Old Testament, the 12 brothers of Joseph and the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles? What are you talking about? 12, 12, 12. Why 12? It's the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 hours of day, the 12 hours of night. God's son, that's why 13 is an unlucky number. God's son with his chosen 12 is a divine number in heaven, 13. So consequently, the whole of Western civilization is based, all religion is based on astrology. We just don't know that. And that's why the church has told you have nothing to do with it because they don't want you to know the real truth. We need to understand astrology is the basis for all religions in the world. And then the 9-11. The 9-11, I could get into that too, but... Um, another oh, time? Yeah, another time, because okay. it, it would require too much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that my phone number is 505-9911. Okay. 9-11, that's my new phone number. 505-9911, <laughs> 9-11. I uh, just wanted to ask you if you had any comments on the red planet Mars oh. and if there was any uh, symbolism to the fact it uh, recently passed for it at its closest point to the planet Earth and uh, we're now in a war. Yeah, let me say this. Uh, well, I, that opens up a whole can of worms because... Um, I, I met many times, but uh, I met up in Oakland about four or five years ago. I met up in Oakland with about eight other people. It was a secret meeting I was invited to. And for three days and three nights, we were all uh, enclaved <clears throat> at the hotel. Uh, Richard Hoagland was there, Richard, myself, and uh, there was uh, six or seven other people. And what we did is we, we stayed, we paid for the, um, the restaurant in the hotel. We paid, all of us chipped in and paid for the, the particular table in the back of the restaurant for three days. We took it over and commandeered it for three days. And the idea was, is that the eight or ten of us, whatever it was, uh, would sit there from morning till night and go through each other's work. Richard Hoagland sat right with me for three days and heard all of my material, heard it all, and uh, we talked about Mars, and he, he divulged a lot of stuff that he's never talked about in public. <clears throat> and um, that was a very fascinating time. Incidentally, uh, he, went by, he went on um, uh, Art Bell and was talking about the, all the Masonic symbolism at NASA and all that stuff. And that was my stuff. I'm the one that told him that. And I called him after I heard him on Art Bell. I called him and said, uh, I told him, I said, Richard, it was great, sensational. I said, where'd you get all that information? He said, oh, well, I got it from you. I said, you got it from me? Three hours I sat and listened to you on Art Bell. I didn't hear my name. Did I hear my name? I was wondering where you must have got that from. I thought we had an arrangement. What we said up there in San Francisco, up in Oakland, was not ever to be discussed in public, right? So I'm the one that brought David Icke to America, incidentally. So if you like David Icke, I'm the one that brought him here. If you don't, I'm, you know, I'm the one that brought him here. And I'm not very happy about that. 
Thank I'm you. very unhappy with David Icke. But anyway, huh? Thank you. Yeah. I brought David Icke to America, and I financed him to make him a star. I seen the day he doesn't even talk to me, doesn't even say hello. <clears throat> but uh, Mars, yeah, I think that there's a whole story about Mars that has not been told and it's going to come out that there might very well be life there now. Do you know that uh, Tom, ben, Tom Ben Flander has um, a website and he's one of the most uh, legitimate, de jure, real physicists, uh, plasma physicists um, in the, in, in the world today, a very important man, and he has on his website pictures of artifacts on Mars's surface that I've never seen before. He's got pictures, actual zoomed-in pictures. <clears throat> and you got to remember, Tom Van Flanders is a very important man in the world of science today, and he's got pictures of of, uh, of uh, cylinders on the face of Mars going into the Earth, I mean into Mars and coming out, they're like a subway system and it's, and it's like plastic or glass and you can see the, the wrappings around some kind of material wrapped around these cylinders. They must be huge but they come out of, out of the surface of Mars and go back in, they go behind huge mountains and come back out and go back down again. It looks like a subway system. And when, you, and when you look at this thing, you tell, what the hell is the subway system doing on Mars? And in this uh, article, he's saying that there are many things that, that NASA has known that's on Mars that they haven't told you yet. Subway systems, and this is very highly technical, the way he explained it, to be able to do what the, well, whoever this was that did it, uh, to be able to build around mountains and sweep down into the, into the ground, come back out over here, go around the mountain over here and come back in. Who knows how to build subway systems like that? And you can see through them. You can actually see through them. So they're either plastic or glass or plexiglass or something. Uh, I think that there's a lot more going on on the planet Mars right now, and there may even be a civilization there now watching us. Maybe that's where we came from originally. I mean, I've sat with Zachar I sent Zachariah Sitchin around the world, <clears throat> I think six, seven times. I sent him to Egypt, I sent him to Mazalan, I sent him to Turkey, I sent him to, uh, to uh, Israel, I sent him to Egypt, I sent Zachariah to seven countries of the world. I did it personally, I sent him, and I was going to do a 13-week mini-series with Zachariah, and uh, Zachariah is sensational, I love him. But I, I, I did a contract with Zachariah where uh, my company in San Diego was going to finance a 13-week miniseries we were going to sell to PBS. And he agreed to do it. And we sent him to seven different countries. And uh, then the poor uh, mentally deranged moron that I was working with that, was ha that held the checkbook decided uh, one halfway through the project that she didn't want to finance it anymore. She didn't want to do it anymore. That's it. And I had to call Zachariah and tell him, Zachariah, you're not going to believe this. You know, this woman has pulled out on us at the last minute. She's got the money, but she just decided she didn't want to do it anymore. And of course, my feeling is Zachariah Sitchin, he doesn't care. I mean, hell, I sent him around seven, seven countries of the world and sent him to all the best hotels and financed him and sent him all over the earth. Hey, if you've got any other brilliant ideas, you know, give me a call. I mean, he wasn't offended. But... Um, <clears throat> There's all kinds of people that I have <clears throat> been in contact with for many, many years behind the scenes that I've never told anyone. And my, I mean, you know, 13, 12 years ago, 12 years ago, I, I produced a video called Matrix. <clears throat> Matrix of Power. And I got all kinds of phone calls from Hollywood stars, from all kinds of motion picture people talking, talking to me, oh man, a sensational idea of a Matrix, a Matrix of Power. And then, of course, then they come out with a movie called Matrix. You know, so I've been on the cutting edge of this stuff for many years, and I have uh, uh, Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell used to get my stuff out in Santa Monica at the uh, Mandela Books, and um, and um, some of the stuff that was in my old basic slide presentation ended up in one of the movies called Stargate. Um, I mean, I've been supplying Hollywood. And I know I've been doing it because I get phone calls from 
big name movie stars say, oh, that was sensational. Well, we ought to make a movie on that. And then a year or two later, there's a movie on it. And so last time I got uh, a very important movie star called me and said, oh, man, your stuff is sensational. I love it. Uh, got all of your tapes. And I said, do you really like it that much? Oh, yes, yeah, sensational. I said, did you ever uh, send me a check? You know, you ever thought about cutting me a check? Oh, no, well, no, I, there's no problem. We'll do that. Yeah, I'll get around to that. No, I've never received a dime from anyone. Not even a thank you. Um, I have a question. I know that you said that you were going to talk later about, or another, an, on another occasion, about your interpretation of the New Testament. Hopefully, I will. I well, will hopefully you will, yes. Um, but what about the avatar stories from around the world, you know, the ancient um, Krishna and Rama and Osiris stories and so forth? Um, I also, years ago, heard someone talk about the incident in the New Testament in which Lazarus is described as rising and showing that the exact same story occurs in ancient Egyptian mythology where um, Bethany is Betanu and um, Lazarus, I believe, is Lazareu. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same story. The, the names are changed just ever so slightly. So there are obviously these correspondences through time and yes. different places, but what do you think about the fundamental concept of the avatar phenomenon? I think that uh, Manley P. Hall said it best. He explained that whole thing in a lecture once where the, there seems to be a divine mandate in heaven that in all periods of darkness, when there seems to be darkness encroaching on the human family, that the spirit of the universe uh, calls out individual people <clears throat> and your spirit is moved to do something to help your fellow man to be a teacher. And so there have always been teachers who have been called in, in the last and final parts of a dark time on the earth where, where the universe puts it into certain people's hearts to, to, to be like an avatar, to be like uh, a teacher. Well, we don't have any problem talking about uh, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, any of the prophets of old and Joel and the Apostle Paul, but to bring it down into modern day. Uh, now that's different. Now if you're going to talk about God's leading you to do something, you must be an idiot. Now Billy Graham, we understand, he's, he's being led by the Lord. Uh, you know, go look in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language, look at the word Lord. L-O-R-D comes from L-A-R-D. That's the way it was spelled in the King's English, Lord. <laughs> so consequently, when I see, you know, I'm serious. This is why Christ is a Christos, is oil. Well, congealed oil is the Lord, Lord. But uh, the, high, uh, the idea of an avatar or a teacher has been with us for thousands of years. And it's true. Every time the world is heading into darkness, it seems like God or the divine presence in the universe moves certain people in their heart to stand up against the darkness and help their fellow man, like the scripture says, you know, just carry even one candle will light a darkened world. So I believe that there is something to this idea that God raises up individuals to enlighten his fellow man at, you know, in dark periods of history. Could I ask you one other question about astral theology? <clears throat> Have you looked into the Mayan calendar? What do you think about that? Well, I think the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incas and the Toltec and all of those ancient people, I think South America and Central America is just cram filled with interesting ancient stuff. And we, we, we tend to feel that the Egyptians and the people from that area of Africa and in Europe somehow or another got over here to South America because we still have the same pyramids and the same uh, symbolism. We find the same symbolism in Central and South America we find in, in, in the, the Middle East. And so obviously they, they came from the Middle East and, uh, and Egypt and Africa across to, uh, to South and Central America. I'm saying, uh-uh, maybe not. Maybe it started in Central America and South America and went to that way. Why, why do you, and I am totally convinced in my own mind <clears throat> that the most ancient 
cultures on the face of the earth, as in South America and Central America, probably 100,000 years old or more. In, in Peru, in the Brazil, and that whole area of the world, I think, is just replete with ancient stuff that far, far exceeds anything Egypt ever did. <clears throat> so I'm seeing that there's a whole world of, uh, of questions that we've never been allowed to ask. I think the Central and South America is the epitome of ancient civilizations. I don't even know, uh, I don't think that the ancient Mayas and the Aztecs and those people, those are the ones we know of. I think that there were some very old ones like uh, Earth Base One. Earth Base One is in the Andes, it's as high up in the Andes as you can get and it is a profoundly, it's so high up that people going there today can hardly breathe. Even mountain climbers say it's very difficult to breathe. It's so far, so high up, and yet the stones are like 100 tons, 300 ton stones, and they're all cut flawlessly and pieced together. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, who moves 200 ton stones in air that even the best mountain climbers can hardly catch your breath? And there's no way to plant food up there. You don't plant anything up at that, at that height. So how did these people feed themselves and move two and three hundred ton stones? And not one from all over. They're just huge uh, temples built with these stones. And I'm saying somebody better start looking at this. I'll tell you what I think really happened. I think that we are a creation of someone else. I think that's what happened. I think somebody came here a long time ago and created us, and they're still with us. Where is Earth Base One that you refer to? It's, it's um, I'm not sure. I think it's Ecuador, but I'm not sure. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you where you can find it. Why don't you just look for it? It's just call Earth Base One. You can look for it in reference works. And on the, on the web, they got a lot of material on Earth Base One. They call it Earth Base One because it's, it seems to be the oldest city on the earth. Incidentally, they say Jericho was the oldest city. No, Jericho is not the oldest city in the world, heaven. <clears throat> earth Base One, now that's old. You know the story about the walls come tumbling down from Jericho? There's only one problem with that story. Jericho never had any walls. You know, I don't know how the walls could fall down from Jericho when they never had any walls, but we don't let things like that bother us. But what I was referring to about the Mayan calendar, 2012, I mean, do you I know. think... 2012, I know. Uh, I don't know what that's going to bring, but I got a feeling it's going to... It's going, something is very big is going to happen in 2010 to 2012. We're already in, the, what is it, the age of the fifth sun now? I think Thanks. that's what they call it. That, all of that kind of stuff, I think, is very, very legitimate. I don't, I'm not a world's foremost authority on it, but I know enough about it to know it's very legitimate. Yes. Uh, hold on a second. They want to do a quick tape, uh, tape oh, change. Okay. So then I got my two questions. I'll drink to that. Okay. <laughs> Incidentally, I did a <clears throat> television. Uh, I've done quite a few here lately. I did uh, a piece for um, Discovery Channel. I did one for Learning Channel. I did one for Arts and Entertainment. <clears throat> I did one for C uh, for CBS. Um, okay. We're rolling. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, I was just going to tell you something that happened on that on that on well, go that, ahead, uh, then I'll occasion questions. when I was working for. Uh, that kind of points up what the what the uh, networks are all about. Um, well, let me let me just tell you very quickly. I, I was I was uh, hired to do three of a four-part series. The fourth one uh, I didn't work on, but the but the three I did, and the fourth one was um, or the one I did not work on. You may have heard of it, heard about it. It's called the Incredible Discovery of Noah's Ark on CBS. Uh, I did not work on that one. That was the third in the series. The first two was the um, Ancient Mysteries of the World Part 1 on CBS and Ancient Mysteries of the World Part 2. Then came the, this, 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 the Incredible Discovery of Noah's Ark and then came 
the fourth one, which is uh, Ancient Mysteries of the World, in which Anthony Hilda was on that one with me. But the third one in line, I did not work on it happily because uh, there were a lot of lawsuits and a lot of bad blood because of that, because of that, and the company, the production company out of uh, Utah went broke because of it, mm. because of the lawsuits. And the reason why is because a lot of atheists and agnostics and humanist organizations and people around the country got really upset because uh, CBS did not put a disclaimer saying that this is just entertainment. We didn't really find Noah's Ark. I mean, but they didn't do that. They said the incredible discovery of Noah's Ark and they went on to show that here's the pictures of Noah's Ark, and here's, and it was so ludicrous, it was so incredibly ludicrous, I, I, I was laughing at it. It showed the, the guy taking a picture of Noah's Ark, and then it said, but he fell off the, 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 the ledge, and, and they couldn't find him because he died in the snow, and, uh, and so that's why they don't have the camera in the original picture. And I'm thinking, well, if you don't have the original picture, what the hell are we looking at then? You know, and well, what are we looking at if, if you don't have the original picture? And so consequently, I was called back to work on the fourth one, and so I asked the field director, I asked the field director, I said, did you guys, uh, you guys got a, a lot of heat from that last one you did on the incredible discovery of Noah's Ark? He said, yeah, a lot of lawsuits, a lot of stuff. And, uh, and I said, did you guys really find Noah's Ark? And he said, come on, this is America, you don't have to be intelligent here, this is just entertainment. You know, I mean, this is America, my God. This is not Europe. You know, you don't have to be intelligent here. You just tell the people what they want to hear. And I thought, well, that's, that's, you know, that was over dinner with the whole crew. And I, I asked him, you really find, he said, come on. We tell the people what they want to hear. This is CBS. It's just the money. It's just, it's just a business, okay? We tell people what they want to hear. So that tells you something about uh, CBS and the rest of them. Well, it's Hollywood. Touche. <laughs> so what's your question? Oh, okay. My old friend. My good friend. Um, first one, I want to make a note about Darth Vader. He's also a lord of Sith. S-I-T-H. Hmm. Good. So I, I follow the Star Wars stuff, so I yeah. figured I'd want to give you that pointer there. Throw that one in. Okay. Right. So it's documented now. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding um, Isis, Ra, Elohim. Yeah. El. Yeah, Isis yeah. Ra El. El. Okay. Isis was a feminine principle of wisdom in Egypt. It's spelled I S I S, Isis. Then the coming of one of the pharaohs changed the worship of Isis to the worship of Amun Re, mm -hmm. Amen Ra, mm -hmm. which is in incidentally why Christians still say Amen at the end of their prayer because they're sending a prayer through God's Son, Amen Re, Amun mm -hmm. Ra, Amen. And consequently, when they when the Phoenician Canaanites, <clears throat> when the Hebrews went in north into Palestine, they encountered a people that were already there for thousands of years. They were called Palestinians, which was very clever. I mean, that's where you would expect to find Palestinians is in Palestine. And so when they went into Palestine, uh, they, they had already learned all the wisdom and the, and the religious teachings of Isis, spelled I-S-I-S, then they learned the new concept of the new religion of Amun-Re, R-A, and now they encountered the Palestinians, and the Palestinians' god was El, the planet Saturn, El, E-L. Consequently, the religion grew out of Isis, Ra, El, I-S-R-A-E-L. Israel is nothing more than Isis, Ra, and El. Consequently, there's nothing holy about Israel. And why is Israel, why is Jerusalem called the holy city? The holy city is because, yeah, <laughs> they're full of holes. The holy city is because every kind of licentious, filthy, degenerate religion that can come into the mind of men has been practiced there. Everything from child sacrifice, pornography, violence, human sacrifice, I don't care how filthy it is or how dirty it is, they were doing it in Jerusalem. And that's why symbolically God's Son, the light of the world, would say to Jerusalem, 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 killer of the prophets and stoner of those sent to you. Anything that is truly enlightened and intelligent wouldn't have a damn thing to do with you. 
All you do is child sacrifice, pornography, violence, money grubbing, money changers. Mm -hmm. The whole thing was filthy from day one. There ain't nothing holy in Jerusalem. Ain't never been nothing holy in Jerusalem. And there's nothing going to be holy in Jerusalem, Salt Lake City, Rome, or any place else. Religion is nothing more than manipulation of the human mind. There is a powerful spiritual dynamics to the universe, but unhappily most Americans haven't got into the famous idea about any of that. And I think that that's what's coming. I think there's going to come a time when we're going to start, tra start thinking in terms of, wait a minute, let's back up and look at this all over again. Who are we really, and what is astrology, and what is the Bible, and who really wrote it? And that's what I'm hoping to do, to be able to enlighten people that there's something else going on we haven't been told. Yes, okay. what else? And the final thing is, um, a friend of mine wanted me to ask you, uh, where, where does the, what is the Jesus, the oil Christ um, story actually fit then? What is the... Um, or who is Jesus Christ to you, or is your understanding of these things? Well, Christ is merely oil, and oil was used uh, to anoint kings and princes, and all of the ancient world, all the ancient world always uh, anointed their kings and rulers and princes with oil. They poured it in the head of the kings and princes, and they were, therefore you were anointed. The word anoint was a word that was used in relation to sex. And so the king always represented the penis head. The king was always the big cock in town. He was the major penis head. He was the major man. He represented the male fertility. And all the women belonged to him. He was the king. So he represented the male phallic. And in the ancient world, they always lubricated the head of the male phallic in sex. So that's why you would anoint the head of the king. The head of the king represents the head of the penis because the whole concept of man ruling is a sexual thing. It's been around for thousands of years, the war between male and female. That's a war going on between male and female. And in the patriarchal system of things, the king represented the male phallic. And we got a bunch of Peter heads still running in Washington, D.C. They're all a bunch of penis heads. They think with their, with, their, with their penis. They think with their penis. That's all they are. That's all, you know, Bill Clinton, he thinks he's the only one. That whole, that whole thing is filthy. It's nothing more than sex and power. We're talking about mafia, sex, drugs, entertainment, buying and selling. Anyway. Hello. Hello, Jordan. I hope I don't offend anyone. <laughs> that, that was great. And my name being Christopher, which involves the Christos or Bless the Christopher, you, yes, Bless you. carrier of Christ or whatever. Um, I've had to go with that my entire life. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful name. I, I think it's uh, a wonderful, wonderful name. It made me think there when you were talking about it how, you know, oil, of course, to the ancient world was also things that kept an artificial light going in the right. darkness, exactly. so that, that's probably where that uh, applies. Um, I had seen you before talking about uh, the water carrier, uh, the bringer of water, like oh, yeah. in, in the, uh, uh, the last uh, test. Aquarius, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the symbology there as it yeah. applies astrologically now yeah. that we're and going from the Piscean into the Aquarius? And Luke 10:20. 10.22, in the book of Luke, Jesus is saying to his chosen twelve, this is a symbolic story, and Jesus is saying to his chosen twelve, they ask him, where are we to go now that we are going to celebrate the last Passover? Where are we to go? Uh, and he says, go into the city, and you will see a man carrying a water pitcher. Go into the house of the man with a water pitcher. Well, anybody who has ever read anything about astrology knows that the house of the man with the water pitcher is a house of Aquarius. So every 2,000 years, and everyone has a different calculation. The Chinese say it's 2,150 years. The Egyptians said it was 2,125 years. Uh, the Sumerians said it was 2,100 and something years. So everybody's got a different uh, calculation. That's why Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, only the Father who knows. 
but, um, but every 2,000 years, the sun enters a new constellation of the zodiac at the equator. If you go to the equator and look, stand right on the equator and look east, and when the sun rises, you will see a constellation of the zodiac. And for 2,100 years, the sun rises on that constellation. But you will see it at the beginning, it's over here. And for 2,100 years, the constellation keeps moving until it hits a point over here, and now it's leaving. And now the next constellation is coming in. So every 2,100 so years, the, con the next constellation moves in. So God's Son is our risen Savior. He rises in the next constellation of one of his chosen 12. And so in Luke 10, uh, 20, uh, 10.22, he says, Go into the house of the man with the water pitcher. What we're talking about is Jesus was the great fisherman, represented by the fish because it's Pisces. We've been living in the age of Pisces for 2,000 years. So when we hear people today saying we're living in the end times, the last days, we are living in the end times, last days of Pisces. And before Pisces, go backwards, this is the way you do it, you go backwards in the zodiac, not forward. What was the constellation 2,000 years before Jesus? was the Aries, the ram. That's why the Jews blow the ram's horn. The shofar is when the sun would come up, they would blow the ram's horn because it's the 2,000 years of Aries, the ram, God's son in the age of the ram. And, and that was, and, and then of course Moses inaugurated the 2,000 years of Aries, the ram, that blow the ram's horn. And that's why when Moses comes back down from the mountain, he sees the children of Israel worshiping a golden calf. Golden, the sun. Calf, Taurus, the bull. The Taurus, the bull, golden calf. Consequently, the Jews were into astrology. And they realized that every 2,100 years, the sun, the redeemer, our, our risen savior, will come back into his kingdom. And now we're waiting for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Meaning that we're waiting for the sun to rise on a new dawn, a dawning of a new era in which mankind will now step into the age of Aquarius for the next 2,000 years of human existence the Bible is replete with this stuff, and all you got to do is spend hours and days and weeks at the, at the seminars and the seminaries and talk with the rabbis, and they all tell you, of course, that's what it's all about. I had one of the highest ranking rabbis in America. I'm not going to give you his name because people will see this, and I don't want him calling him, but he's, in, he's back in Massachusetts. He's probably gone now. This is many years ago, but we used to talk about this. He was a... He was the head of a, of a very powerful rabbinical association. And I used to ask him, I said, Rabbi, tell me the truth. Was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I mean, did these people actually live? And he said to me, look it, you've got Isis, Osiris, Horus. You've got Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. You've got Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hey, we're Jews, we've got to have something too, right? Everybody's got to have a triune God, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Osiris, Horus, Isis, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So we got to have something. Okay, so we got uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do you like that? Well, was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I don't know. Was it an Osiris, Isis, and Horus? No. Well, it's just a story. There was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There was no Abraham. Abraham, the Jewish reference work will tell you, was Abram. Abram, Abram, Ab, Ab, and the ancient Hebrew meant father, and Ram was the Ram, I, uh, Aries the Ram. He was your father for 2,000 years. He was your father. Abram. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is nothing more than the triune God, and the triune God is nothing more than the sun and the, and the rising, the sun at 12 noon, and the sun at, in the evening. The newborn, the full-grown, and the man that dies. The triune God. And that's why it's still the sun. It's the sun in the morning, it's the sun at high noon, and it's the sun at night. So it's still the same God. It's three persons in one God. 
Yeah, the one God is a son in this three points in his life. So consequently, this is a fascinating material. When you start talking to the rabbis and doing a research, and you find out, my God, how long have you known this? You know, have you known this all your life? Yeah. And I, and I said to him, why don't you tell other people this? I and mean, this is fas fascinating stuff. And he said, look, what do you want me to do? I got to go out and get a job? Come on. <laughs> you know, if I tell, tell people what the real truth is, I mean, I'm not going to be a rabbi very long. So anyway. As far as you know, is there any validity to the stories of Jesus fathering uh, children to Mary well, Magdalene? That's the very interesting, that's Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the British Israel, Holy Blood, Holy Grail uh, material that's very interesting. I don't think so at all. I don't think there is. I think it is a front. I think it is a story that's being put out by the Illuminati to give legitimacy to their coming world power, that they want to run the world and therefore they got legitimate reasons because Jesus is their father, they, they, their, their great, 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 great grandfather. So I don't think there's any, any validity to it at all, but I do think British Israel Freemasons are using it. The British Israel philosophy is nothing more than a front for a group of men who think they're going to control the world and they're trying to make, lend legitimacy to it by saying that Jesus fathered them. I know that whole story. Believe me, I've been following it for years. It first came out to my attention from uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail with Bajan Lee and Lincoln, but my God, since then there's been about 25 books uh, written on that subject of Jesus fathering children. I don't believe it for a minute. I think it's a front story. I think it's a cover story for the Illuminati who's trying to take over the world and make themselves look legitimate. They're nothing but scum as far as I'm concerned. Jordan Maxwell, please give him a hand. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Thank you. This guy could go on for weeks with this stuff, and sometimes will, unless he's... Uh, I'm assuming that I'm <laughs> through here, I guess that's what yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've just given you the, the, uh, the hook here, kid. Um, listen, thank you uh, for showing up uh, on Rose Bowl night. Thank you, Wendy, for carrying on. Uh, the Joan of Arc, uh, when the country is uh, at risk. If it wasn't for her, uh, we wouldn't That's be right. here tonight. We Give Wendy a hand, please. God bless. And Happy New Year to you all. And good night. And good night. <laughs>